so till now we have seen uh, how we proceed ahead uh, once we are in a new organization or we are trying to assess the you know security risk in an organization with a risk management approach so under that we first understood certain security co concepts which are applicable and then we realized how to carry out a risk management and what are the steps leading to it so for that we realized okay first we need to carry out a business objective analysis and once we have understood the business requirements and uh, how the business functions then we try to understand what security arrangements are already in place then we work out a security framework and then we carry out a risk management so once we come came to risk management we saw different techniques of how to carry out risk management okay and whether it is qualitative techniques quantitative techniques to analyze risk you need to know what are the threats what are the vulnerabilities okay and uh, once you have understood what are threat vulnerabilities then you rank the risks and then you evaluate which controls need to be put in place to mitigate oblique transfer oblique you know ignore the risk so you you know uh, based on your marking system whether where the risk stands okay now going ahead we uh, have to understand that only by doing this analysis is not enough we need to uh, create a documentation get it approved and put it as a document in our organization okay so once you have done a risk assessment uh, you create a risk documentation you create something called a risk register and the risk register has the inventory of all the assets and all the risks faced to a particular asset okay so you generally maintain uh, uh, one page per per uh, one column per risk in if you have a grc platform with you if you have, so that day i was missing out so there's a platform called you know archer so archer is a, one of the uh, well known grc platform so if you have a grc platform you note down all your risks in a in a columnar manner in the so if there are it risk data risk facility risks infrastructure risk financial risk there might be multiple risks so you Put, it's a kind of a spreadsheet basically nothing much but you can correlate that spreadsheet to the tasks which are associated with it so it's it's basically a, a i say it's just an erp uh, software where you can follow up with each risks automatically if you create those rules then you can automatically revisit those risks in a, uh, a certain amount of time and it creates a, it creates a database of all the risks for you and you can follow it up so once you have done that, you create all the documentation. Basically, the risk register becomes your master documentation, and the risk management policy and the risk management risk assessment becomes your master document, which you store in your organization. And you might have a printed copy for for regulatory practices. You know, wherein some regulatory folks come in and they uh, ask for where is your risk assessment document. So they, 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 this might be the case at times. Okay. So this is where we left it last time. Today we will try to uh, complete business continuity planning. Okay, our aim is to finish business continuity planning, and we will try to see whether we are able to finish laws. Now this is where Parveen, I will clear your doubt. I will give you keywords. Okay, got it. Most of the times, most of the times, uh, you know, it is the keyword which will help you in analyzing whether which law it is uh, since isc square is a, a global exam it will not generally doesn't ask you specific to us questions but it does figure out at times ferpa does come out at times copa because copa is something which you know it's universally universally applicable so if you if there are people who are importing or exporting child pornography then copa comes into you know picture and you can be picked up by FBI right from your country and you know uh, taken out. So th there are uh, issues and matters where uh, you can actually uh, be asked questions about that particular thing. Okay, so this is where we left last time that documentation. Now, uh, you know, security is a you know continuous process, right? And you have to continuously uh, revisit it all the time. So now. Uh, once you go into an organization what state in that organization is is uh, you know given by 
certain enterprise risk management uh, model. So there is a very famous risk maturity model called RMM. Okay. So RMM is used to understand which state of what is your state okay whether your enterprise risk management is in a which uh, stage uh, whether it's in a chaotic stage if it is very chaotic it has just started then it is in an ad hoc stage uh, if it is somewhere there when you are starting your risk management process you know it would be something like a startup will always be somewhere here you know it will be ad hoc. It will be completely chaotic. You're a new organization. You don't know anything about risk management. Somebody might come in. They might bring bring an experienced guy like you know uh, Chaya and put them and say, okay, uh, please start. And that is where it is chaotic right now. So Chaya is trying to put a good process, but the rest everyone doesn't know what is risk management all about because at that point in time, the company is trying to bring in a product. Then the company stabilizes over a period of time, six months, one year, and there are loose attempts to risk management because now you have you know money, you have you can buy some platforms, you can slowly assess what are the assets, uh, you know where you can uh, invest, and the slow starting of risk management process begins. So the risk maturity model uh, at that point in time, that organization will will be called being in a preliminary stage. Okay. Once you have now standardized your frameworks, you know which framework to follow. So if there is a framework standardization which has happened in your organization, then you are in a defined stage because now you know where you stand. Okay, So it's in a defined stage. When you start collecting metrics from your risk management and effectively utilize that data, then you are supposed to be called in an integrated where risk management is integrated to your business processes. Okay, So that is the time. You start uh, saying that your uh, organization has an integrated enterprise risk management model. And finally, when you are proactive and your uh, your everything is defined by risk management process, then your organization is called an optimized. So just remember this ADPIO. Okay. So how do you remember ADPIO? You can make a small acronym and you know work it out. So generally, this is how we remember at times but you also don't have to remember this it, I, I have not seen a question where it is asked because if there will be a question what will happen is the question will be given like this okay wherein uh, if even if you are asked a question what will happen is the question will be said okay there are organizations so which which organ this organization is which phase so there will be an option which says ad hoc in a block, something like this, or you have to place a block in a fill in the blanks. So generally the answer is given. So what is what is there you have to know? So if organization is this, then there's a fill in, fill in the blanks. Given. So which one is to fill? So you know that the moment you have gone through something like this, you know, you know that ad hoc preliminary defined, integrated, and optimized. If you've understood that, ad hoc means of course it's chaotic. Preliminary means okay, there are loose attempts. Defined means there is a framework. Integrated means you are able to gather metrics. Optimized means you are geared up for business. You know, you, ba you based on risk management. So yes, RMM is a uh, thing which comes in the exam, but this is how you remember. Okay, and uh, you know, human mind is conditioned to remember something uh, once it goes through a flow of seven times. And uh, if you've gone through it seven times, then uh, I will say that you are more or less, uh, you know, remembering that things. But generally, the, uh, seven times is what makes your subconscious understand. Three times is what your front lobe understands the thing. So if you've gone through th something three, thrice, and that's why I made this presentation, you don't have to go through the book. Okay. If you go through this presentation, everything is covered. You don't miss it. Okay. So remember this. Then what happens is this is a critic. This is this is something which is unique to all organizations. All organizations suffer from it. So. You've done your risk management, you've done everything, you've done your documentation. But what happens is your equipment is reaching end of life, but it's working well. Yeah. It's working pretty well. And you think, uh, 
whether I should discard that equipment. So this this hospital which is working, it says I am on a segregated network. My all USBs are disabled, but it's working well. It's working well for me. I I I don't want to spend money. I don't want to move to cloud. So how do you manage this? Okay. So end of life equipment will be a question always in an in a, in a corporate organization. People will try to business guys will try to run that till it breathes at last. Okay. And if software has not shown many any critical vulnerabilities in last ten years, then the first question they will ask you is. We've not had any issue in last ten years. So, if we have not had any issue in last ten years, then why is it that you are recommending that this equipment be taken out of action? Uh, it's working. It's serving well. So then you do a risk management and you say, okay, let's implement at least this much control. Okay, let's let's keep it in a year gapped environment, or uh, you know, just you have disabled the USBs, you've disabled everything. But people are still working on admin. Let's move it, move them to a different user platform. So you can work out many workarounds. You can implement controls. You can implement policies for, you know, equipment which might be reaching end of life, and there might be a case in point where your equipment might be reaching end of service life. So now, Ubuntu, I think eighteen is out of you know service life. Now most of the web servers are today running on Ubuntu eighteen server. Where is Ubuntu 18 is out of service life. So how do you manage that? So what happens is there are a lot of extra there are a lot of external vendors who come in, okay, who will say, okay, fine, Ubuntu is not providing the Debian organization is not providing you the updates, but I will provide, okay, I will maintain for next five years, okay, and that's when external agencies might come in and maintain that software for you. So you have to look into such, uh, you know. Uh, contingencies. You have to work out such contingencies once you see that your equipment is reaching end of life or end of service life. Okay. So once you have understood the entire risk management process, okay. Uh, if anyone has, if anyone has any doubts, you can please ask. Till now, because I'll catch up a little speed today, because most of these things we have covered. So I'll I'll try to be a little faster and not explain much. If you are having any doubts, ask it now. Otherwise, I'll move a little faster because these are all things which will come on a question. I'll just tell you the keywords which you need to uh, remember. Okay, there's nothing much to understand because you all are more or less experienced people. I've seen for, seen from your conversation, so there is nothing much to understand here. Where there is a point to understand, I'll definitely pitch in. Okay, fine. So I'll I'll proceed ahead. Okay. Uh, so now that framework part where you said that I want to attend, I want to select the framework. Which framework to select? These are the few frameworks which have been discussed in uh, Cybex and generally acceptable in the entire information security world. Generally, okay. So if even if you go to today to LinkedIn and you find to go for a GRC or if you are looking at GRC. Then you will find American companies which deal with federal agencies giving out NIST as their. So you should be able to uh, prior experience in NIST. So fine, NIST is an open document. You can go through it and you can skill yourself up for that interview. Okay. So NISP 837 is a risk management trigger. If you remember this much, this is more than enough. So what do you do? You prepare your objectives. You categorize the risks. You select. Uh, you know uh, what controls do you want to you select? What are controls you want to implement? Assess what how is the uh, situation after you have implemented the control? You authorize the system to be used, and you continuously monitor the system. So what do you have? Okay, you prepare. You prepare for risk management. So you categorize the system. So system is there. Whether it's an information system, it's a physical system, it's a in infrastructural system, it's a process. Or it's a people, so you have to define the system. So you categorize the system, you implement control, select a control, you implement a control, you assess whether the control is working fine, you authorize the system to operate, and then you monitor. This is the NISC SP 837 in a nutshell. And this is all you need to know. If you need to know that, if you know that NIST SP 837 is a control. 
control. It's a control dependent risk framework. This is more than enough. And it is a framework which is used by US federal agencies for risk framework. It is compulsory for federal agencies to use that we will discuss today in the later part. Okay. <clears throat> so this is all you need to remember, Praveen. N nothing more than this. Got it. Yeah, this is what I just discussed. Okay. So I'll skip through this. I've already discussed this. All, all these slides will be made available to you. And uh, if you have done your book once, these slides will definitely help you in your revision. You know, and you can take these slides and actually make your notes. If you take a printout or you use it on some soft copy, you can make your notes and you can actually make out which is your weak area and which is not. So that will help you in this manner. So today I will uh, provide the slides for domain one. Okay, then comes the ISO. Now, ISO is actually a risk management. You can call it, it's, it's a loosely termed risk management framework. It is not a risk management framework. It's a standard given by ISO. So ISO is a British organization, standardization organization. And now it gives standards for all the, you know, uh, any any business you see, whether you, you see, uh, you know, quality assurance, whether you see uh, production engineering, and anywhere you see ISO standards are there. So ISO has a, risk management document called iso 31000 okay out of which iso 27000 series is particularly for information systems management isms okay so if this much is what you remember is more than enough and you should know this five steps okay risk identification risk analysis evaluation and treatment okay and you establish the context okay you monitor and you communicate this is more than enough. And you should know that if risk management is talked about, general risk management is 31,000. ISMS specific risk management is 27,005. Okay. Now you will never be having a fill in the blanks which you have to fill. These are choice answers, right? So choice answers are easy. If you know this much, there are four answers. You will be able to select it out, right? It is only the knowledge. So unless you don't know that 27,005 is the risk management document for ISO series, particularly for ISMS, then you will not be able to attempt this question. But if you know the difference between 31,000, 27,000, 27,005, then you will be able to solve it. So 31,000 is the general, it is a general, generic risk, risk management document, how to carry out risk management. What are the standards for risk management? 27,005 is specific to ISMS. Okay. And the ISO 27,000 series deals with ISMS. And the risk management is dealt by, dealt by 27,000 times. That's it. ISO over. And there are certain specific standards which we talked about like last time, 27,001, 2 gives controls, 3 gives what. That is something which you have to study on your own. That is something which you, even if I tell you, which I've told you last time. Uh, Commons you should know, health you should know, okay, which are the standards for health, which are the standards for internet, which are the standards for risk management. These are something common which you should generally glance through. Because once it comes in the exam, you'll know, okay, fine, 27015 is for what? 27079 is for what? These are the common ones. <laughs> okay. Uh, COSO is an organization uh, uh, that is committee for sponsoring uh, sponsoring organization of the Trade Ways Commission. Okay. At times, this does comes in. It is an enterprise risk management and it gives you an in integrated framework. Okay. Uh, this is more of a uh, framework which is firstly you know, what happened was a tradeway commission was uh, formed after the famous uh, you know Enre, uh, I think Enron uh, debacle so they basically came out that there has to be a lot of internal controls in an organization to report what is the wrong going happen okay and we should continuously uh, you know, ask organization to internally report their controls. What are the mechanisms which they have established whenever you are dealing with public money? So you have collected a lot of money by, you know, IPOs and uh, selling shares. And now public money is there with you. Now you are, you know, what happened with, you know, F, uh, this uh, Sam Bankman Fried with the cryptocurrency exchange, which went down with for $32 billion. Now, how can something like this happen when once once you have you know you have faced enron you have said you've seen lemon brothers you know going down so 
uh, the Stradway Commission gives that you you to be regulatory applicable, you have to give internal controls. So COSO gives you a framework for internal control alignment. Okay. So if you want to have a good internal control arrangement, go for COSO. Okay. So remember this. Okay. And you have to adhere to ethical, legal and ethical. Okay, so a uh, lot of auditors use this framework for auditing uh, organizations for financial irregularities. Okay. Now, once you see risk management, risk management is a generic concept, right? You can apply it for IT also. So COSO is supposed to be called a three-dimensional model. Okay, it's at times used and to call it called a three-dimensional model. These are the steps you have the control environment, you carry out a risk assessment, you implement control, basically control activities. Okay, then you inform and communicate to everyone who is supposed to use that system and then you continuously run and monitor the system, okay? And so there's a three-dimensional three model which it explains. If you remember this much, it's more than enough, okay? COSO is generally not asked in the exam, okay? I have not seen uh, anyone asking COSO, but the moment internal controls come into picture, remember SOC2 and COSO, remember this. Then there's the ISACA's risk IT framework. So ISACA had a, a risk framework. So these are the kind of frameworks which nobody is going to ask you that what is ISACA's risk IT framework principle number four. Sorry, no, nobody will ask you. Okay, at max it might come is that ISACA, ISACA is a uh, in a qualitative versus quantitative risk framework. Which what is more important and you know something like that and the basis will be given for the question and you might come to know okay fine this is isaka risk it framework which is just talking about now again isaka is not asked generally okay because isaka is isc squares competitive uh, organization so nothing regarding to isaka is generally asked so you can be uh, free from that okay uh, generally COVID uh, was given by isaka but COVID is at times COVID is asked because COVID is a universally applicable framework so uh, what Isaka's risk IT framework gives is the five examples. You firstly connect the business objective. You align the IT risk with the uh, business objective. You carry out a cost benefit analysis. Okay, and uh, you give a prom uh, you have a fair communication and uh, open communication with the management and the employees and the systems. Okay, uh, you establish accountability and then you implement risk as part of your daily activity. So this is risk. IT framework as far as the SAFA is concerned. It is boring. There's nothing to understand. It is just a cram, but not required to be crammed because such questions are never asked. Okay, you should know that yes, once somebody asks me COSO, it has to be a 3D. 3D is the keyword and internal control is the keyword. Okay, I should remember this. That internal control is generally COSO and SOC2. So whether it is asking internal control reporting, then SOC2. Internal control framework, COSO. I hope you guys will remember this, OK? Then Octave is another uh, you know, qualitative risk evaluation criteria, which can be used by organizations. OK, it is directed towards individuals. I highlighted this, OK? Who are responsible for managing the organizational operational risks. So it is directed towards individuals who are going to carry out a risk analysis for an organization. So it gives out what you need to do, and uh, it gives you step by step what you need to do and how to assess risk. So if you see a question which says uh, a framework which is directed towards individuals in managing organizational operational risk, you know that it is pointing at Octave. Okay. But this question, such questions are never asked. You will be asked a question where you understand what is qualitative and what is quantitative okay the question will be as simple as that that in an organization which was carrying out octave it is to con confuse you right it will be to confuse you uh, uh, a high ranking senior official was carrying out octave based risk analysis for the organization and has categorized his risk as high leo medium what approach has he adopted okay you so there will be a long answer given in carrying out a quantitative analysis High low medium is used, and therefore he is carrying out quantitative analysis. Now, if you are not reading the answer well, you will do mistakes. You will say, okay, high low medium is qualitative, but by mistake, you will tick on quantitative. 
because the answers are jumbled what happens is you know the answer will be a is this 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 this, this, this. b is this 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 this, this. C is this, 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 and D is. You've read here quantitative, okay? Quantitative involves high, low, medium, and therefore he is carrying out octaves, okay? Here it will be like a qualitative, same answer, qualitative, high, low, medium, but the only difference is quantitative and qualitative. Rest all answers will be probably you have eliminated, right? You know that the answer is B, but in your mind, your mind will play tricks with you and you will still say okay answer is a you will think that i have chosen qualitative and i have picked a this is where you will go wrong it happens okay so be very careful when you re when you are reading the question okay <coughs> so this is what is octave is all about okay so now gentlemen with this we have come to end of the risk management topic okay so we are done with uh, risk management uh, and these are the risk frameworks which you should know octave nist uh, cobit cobit we have already discussed and coso uh, to subway so at times you might get a question of tradeway commission remember tradeway commission means coso just keep that in mind and uh, questions do figure out for iso yes so iso you should go through in a thorough you should know which frameworks uh, which frameworks apply to which organization you should have the 27015 double and basically health you should be able to privacy and health are uh, two important aspects of cissp so whatever assesses privacy whatever whatever assesses health and now ot security okay operational risks operational security is also uh, in uh, so iot or ot ot security also comes to uh, operational technology security is a uh, in thing uh, be aware if ISOs, any chapter deals with OT security. Okay. Now, uh, one of the most important part of any organization are the human beings. Jim. And if you have secured your human risks, then you have uh, done ninety percent of your part. You see, any organization, even the last pass hack, which is now very, very, uh, you know, famous now, uh, that is supposedly. Uh, been a social engineering, a very sophisticated social engineering attack, and uh, wherein the employee was probably tracked. That has not come out, but people are saying it was a very, very, uh, very high level of social engineering attack. Okay, social engineering attack can be as simple as you know somebody sitting on a train with you and stealing your ID card, and uh, somebody tracking you over a period of time and understand that this person is someone whom I can. So there are cases in which, uh, you know, people will try to track you physically and try to get your card. You are, you live outside, you're a young employee. You don't know much about, uh, you come from outside. Uh, hackers do personally trail people and try to get cards and try to make an entry. Such things do happen, and it's not uncommon. Okay. Uh, recently, the, so you can read the book. That is fine. But recently, I was speaking to a, a call center call center employee, and to assess their uh, security, I asked. I I I first tried to give my information because my information is pretty valid, and then I tried to know about their systems through a voice call. I tried to escalate my problem and see how much deep can that person go in their systems. And I realized, okay, after some level, uh, she said, sir, I cannot uh, access this data. I have to escalate it. So there was some amount of privilege up to which this customer support would have worked. So yes, if, uh, organizations do implement social engineering issues on their platform. Okay. Uh, how can you get social engineered? malicious websites, voice calls, familiar visits. You know, you, a person comes to your house first time and says, hi, I, 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 uh, you know, I do a servicing of your uh, water system. And he comes, he gives you three free services. You're very happy. And, you know, he carries out three free services. And he's mapped your house. He's become known to you. Fourth time he comes and steals your, you know, some something critical from the house, as, as critical as your 
you work for Microsoft and he steals your card because he intends to enter Microsoft's office that day. He has tracked you. He's seen that you work from home four days and fifth day you don't work from home. You go to office. So he steals your card on that day when you don't go to office. So <clears throat> you know, familiar visits are a way to, you know, so you need to make your employees aware of that, that training, that you know, awareness has to go into your employee. People will come to you with private assistance, try to help you out, you know, and once people try to help you out, generally we try to be helpful. You know, if somebody comes and says, Ki, uh, you know, I've lost my this, can you please help me? Uh, if a beautiful girl comes and sends you, then you will be more helpful. Okay. So, so such things, uh, you know, people do personal mapping. They're following you on social media. If you are someone very important, uh, then people are mapping you. You know, how mapping happens is, so in my organization, I see my CFO getting mapped. You know, I see my getting, I self, myself getting mapped. I see our CEO getting mapped. In fact, in our organization, one person uh, lost a lot of money uh, because uh, he, that he was a young boy and he got an email that said, hey, I'm in a meeting and I need to make you make, I need you to make a very urgent payment. I'm stuck in a meeting. I'm not just the email name had the name of the CEO. And look at the targeting. He's targeting the most youngest employee who knows who has just entered the organization, must be working remote, and has, may not be onboarded properly, not trained properly, doesn't understand social engineering well. He gets this email and he makes a transfer of 40,000 rupees, close to $1,000, uh, $500 in a period of 20 minutes. So he first makes a 20,000 transfer and then he receives another uh, email. He thanks, you've done it, but uh, there's an immediate requirement of 20,000 more. So this guy goes to his father, takes 20,000 more and deposits it. Okay. So this is a classical example of social engineering. This is money. And there are times credentials get leaked. Uh, now there is MFA theft happening. So <clears throat> the moment there is some someone who tells you to click a link, uh, never send a link, never click a link. You know? uh, if you are uncertain about uh, uh, um, email, you verify it, you verify it in person. So if you receive a mail, so there was a beautiful email which came to our CFO from Barclays. I, I gave that example last time also, I guess, which looked completely genuine. Over the head, it looks completely genuine. How DKIM and how DMARC failed, I don't know. But it looked genuine. It came and uh, my CFO was confused. So she sent me the screenshot and I said, this is a fake. I said, a bank will never send you anything to be clicked. Okay, so we discarded that email and we sent the email. Uh, uh, we sent the email to Barclays to get it confirmed. So what I'm saying is, uh, phishing can only be social engineering can only be uh, thwarted by mainly by training and awareness, and by you know always be erring on the negative side. You always take suspicious. You always be, people who are security conscious are always suspicious of anything which is erring on the negative side. If there is a link, they are suspicious. If there is an email which is out of the context, they are suspicious. And this is what you need to tell your employees uh, that you know, uh, even after putting multiple technical controls, things will go wrong if they are not aware and they are not you know, upright. OK, so how do social engineering works? You know, People will show authority. They will try to intimidate. So authority is. I am the CEO, please transfer 20,000 authority. Intimidate. If you don't do, then I'll tell your parents. So, you know what happens at times, young people, they do something funny on the social engineering. Uh, they might chat with someone, they might do some loose chats or some loose video calls, and then they start getting blackmailed and they get start getting intimidated. And it happens. It's a, uh, uh, our HR does comes up uh, in, in, in our pre previous organization. We, we have seen people getting. Uh, social engineer to levels where you cannot imagine okay and then the video is getting leaked out so this this happens intimidation do happen then consensus you know? somebody says that i love you you they fall in love and say okay let's do let's say hey can you give me your uh, uh, password now i need to log into i need to access your uh, vpn to visit some site which i am not consensus you know you slowly start believing your, the person and social engineering does happen with that. Okay, you create scarcity. You say, okay, it's it's very scarce. You're not. You will. What happens? Only 10, 10 minutes remaining for this offer to be, and you click, you're done. Okay, 
familiarity hey i don't know your friend uh, why don't you come over and this this oh you would you know this you know that so they so these are the principles by which you know uh, a social engineering attack will take place okay uh, there's a thing called prepending okay in prepending what you do is you give something familiar and prepend your message with something familiar looking okay you uh, so like i have been i'm not able to spoof your ip i'm not able to spoof your email address but the first name okay my name is shubhajit na so i send you email hey i am shubhajit na i carry out cisp training so you will say shubhajit na i send you email you will not try to see read even the complete email address okay whether it's a genuine email or not so you prepend so mail headers unless you see a mail header you will find shubhajit na has mailed you okay Or, or your CEO has made you. Right? So these are ways in which social engineering takes place. Okay, uh, phishing is four types. You should know this: spear phishing, veiling, smishing, and wishing. Spear phishing targeted. Okay, if it is, this is the word keyword target. If it is a targeted mail to high level CEO or CFO, it is called spear phishing. Okay, uh, it is targeted. Remember that. Just remember that. Veiling is when it is. targeting only high value individuals okay veiling is when it is targeting high value individuals remember this veiling is they know okay this guy is big shot this might, person might be having a lot of money let's spear fish him and get money out of it that's called veiling smishing is using malicious link you over text messages i send you a whatsapp message i send you a normal sms i get smished okay and wishing is voice voice phishing i said you hey hi can you transfer me uh, this money uh, i am taking your cissp tutoring transfer me this money this is the link or uh, this is the pin or something like that you know i i spam you over telephone which happens you know uh, we, we we see a lot of messages from banks coming that don't give your otp go don't give your pin and this does happen okay so this is an important thing and it keeps uh, keep that in mind okay uh then the another way of carrying out social engineering is spam okay and uh spam is carried out using trojans you send a trojan you send hoax messages you send unwanted emails okay this is how you carry out uh you know the social engineering using spam and how to protect against spam is generally using these three you should know these three okay one is sender policy framework one is domain key identification identified mail and uh, one is dmarc you should know these three uh, key concepts and uh, how spam is protected okay which i'll be uh, discussing forward so what is sender policy framework you basically you know uh, you're sending a email the email is receiving received at the email service what happens is once you are sending it you publish your ip with the dns okay so you publish your ip with the dns when you are receiving the mail you are receiving email server checks us with the dns record if ip is there in the dns record it passes it as valid mail if it is not there it passes it as spam so this is sender policy framework okay but what happens this can be uh, spoofed using uh, this can be spoofed okay you you can send a email with a spoofed ip okay uh, so generally this and policy spf plus dkim forms part of spam control okay <clears throat> the next is domain key identified mail wherein you attach a key with your email okay basically using digital signature so you attach the private key with the mail private key is compared with the public key if your private key and public key matches that means your domain is verified and it is sent to the uh, receiver so this is so you sign your email with a dkim signature it is received at the mail server it checks it with the dns server it has the public key it compares whether public key and private key match if it is matches then it gives you to the inbox if it doesn't match it sends you to the scam spam okay so this is what is dki okay very simple so spf is knows sp in, in case of spf the dns knows what is the ip in case of dki it is no it knows uh, the public private key arrangement so once the private key is attached with the message it compares with the public key if it is a match inbox else spam Sir, and do we, is a, do, sorry to interrupt just yeah. one quick thing sorry uh, so so do yeah. we send a private key itself uh, you sign it you sign it with the private key okay yeah. 
Okay. So if you sign it with the private key, so I I, I didn't logically send it. So ideally, what will happen is there is a message. You could you won't see a private key never, na? You will say you, yeah, so you yeah. sign it with so that's why I said DKM signature, right? So there's a message. You take a hash. You hash it with your private key. Okay, you attach it. You, so there's a signature which comes. You attach it. It comes here. You you know again open this hash with this. A public key. So if it opens, that means got it. You got have signed it. it with a private. So it's a it's a digital signature arrangement, right? <laughs> okay. Those who didn't understand that uh, that we we will cover in detail. So what you should know is there is a correlation existing between what you have done here and what you have done here. So when there's a matching takes place, that match is given as inbox. If it does not match, it is it goes to spam. Okay. <sighs> And DMARC is a protocol which implements SPF and DKIM. Okay, just this is what you should remember. So it's a it's a protocol. DMARC is a protocol which implements, which is built upon on SPF and DKIM. So if it is a, if you are using DMARC, that means you are using both SPF and DKIM to implement email security solution. Okay, and once you implement this, generally you will see that your spoofed emails will not arrive in your inbox. Important. Okay, <clears throat> this is how DMARC works. Uh, not of consequence, so it will check both the IP and the uh, digital signature. So it knows the DMARC policy settings whether you are using SPF or you are using DKIM. If you are using both SPF and DKIM, okay, then then also it can work. And then based on the policy which you have chosen, the DKIM policy, it will accept or reject the mail and send it to your inbox or spam. Okay. Uh, there are many kinds of social engineering attacks. You should know what a social uh, shoulder serving questions do figure out. You know, you're sitting at the airport and the person is trying to overlook what is the kind of attack. It's a social shoulder serving. And you will see in India, it's very common where we don't respect each other's privacy. I'm sitting and working on my laptop and my neighbor will just keep on looking at my laptop. What am I doing? Okay. So I actually have to find a place where I can sit down and work on my PC. So this is very common. Invoice scams. This is what happened with. Uh, uh, so imagine I send you an invoice from a spoofed email and ask you for money. Will you pay or not? So once you see an email from a CEO which says this is the invoice, please pay urgently. And when that person messages to confirm uh, to confirm back, he messages on your phone, and uh, you realize that that WhatsApp is also spoofed. So what has happened is this uh, national institute that the the Pune based company which manufactures the uh, coronavirus vaccine. I, I'm forgetting the name. So they, the, their accountant got fished because he got a mail from the CEO saying that this payment has to be done and he made a two crore payment. Okay. And this attack happened not in one day, it happened over a period of two days. Okay. So I was reading it in the paper. So it's very, very inverse scams do take place. Hoax. I create a hoax that uh, there's a fire in the building. Please vacate, and you know, then the building is vacated, and then you enter the building. Uh, once you impersonate, it's called masquerading. Okay. So once you impersonate a person and try to enter a facility, it's called masquerading. So questions do figure out uh, what is uh, is trying to enter a building, look dressed up as someone else or something. It's called masquerading. Tailgating or piggybacking. I. Uh, Somebody is entering the building. I just follow him or her. You know, so that's tailgating. So the door opens and two people enter rather than one. Dumpster diving. You, you, your organization depends a lot on paperwork, and papers are dumped into the dumpster for destruction. But instead of destruction, people try to, uh, you know, bring out uh, inform useful information from that. So what happens is at times. You've written a password on a slip attached here. The cleaner comes in the morning, he finds a paper dropped, and he finds it. So if a dumpster, somebody is diving through your dumpster, he will be able to take out a credentials. Okay. Baiting is offering you something like a bait. And you know, I say, okay, 10% discount. If you click on this link, you click on this link and you can get social engineered. Uh, you can do credential hijacking, credential hijacking, spoofing. Uh, so if you are uh, working on a uh, insecure wi wireless network. Even today, WPA2 is hacked. I hope you guys know it. You can easily hack it with Kali. 
uh, and if you are using a eight character password kali will hack it in no time okay so i i sit down and do that for my neighbors and uh, if i do that and then i spoof their ip and i uh, i can steal the credentials very pretty easily okay so what i'm saying is it's very easy to so keep a uh, a very strong wifi password <laughs> and with that i can do identity fraud with you okay a type of squatting is uh, uh, i have hacked your system and i am looking at what you are typing okay either i put a keylogger which is nowadays difficult okay keyloggers are identified by most of the antivirus systems but i put your malicious uh, software which records your screen okay and sends it sends send it to me over time and then i see what actually you are typing you know so that is called typo scan uh, url hijacking is uh, if i have not secured my dns then my url url can get hijacked uh, if my dns server itself gets hacked and somebody replaces my dns uh, takes on my dns so my url is hijacked so you type www.onlinesbi.com and you actually reach the hackers website which looks just like sbi and uh, sbi has not come to know till now and then you give your credentials and you are uh, you, give, you end up giving your <coughs> credentials uh, similarly click jacking happens wherein you know uh, somebody might take over the way you are surfing your uh, mouse and where you are going so wherever you are clicking it actually is not the place you are clicking it's taking you to a uh, a malicious website okay and there are influence campaigns so influence campaigns are <clears throat> what few years back you know uh, this uh, uh, a lot of groups carry out influence campaigns so a lot of environment groups carry out influence campaigns a lot of terrorist organized organizations carry out influence campaigns they target your mind and uh, they target your mind in such a manner that you might get compromised and end up getting so you why i'm telling you all this because these are the things which you have to keep in mind when you are an organization any organization and what is applicable to you you need to take train your people for that okay and that's where hybrid warfare comes in so uh, hybrid warfare questions do figure out at times what is hybrid warfare so it will be shown shown that you know targeting of mind and using social media as a tool to uh you know carry out operations other than military operations so that is where hybrid warfare does come in so uh if you are not actually fighting the war but you are still fighting on the information domain then it's called a mix of you know hybrid warfare so if i'm able to project uh you know a nation in a bad manner so right now we all see that ukraine is being projected in a manner that russia is the invader because there's a theme to it right there's a theme that ukraine is under uh, you know attack by russians because russia wants to dominate but the actual issue is uh, ukraine trying to you know align with nato and the main division when it took place uh, ukraine uh, one of the major issues uh, for that separation or the agreement was that ukraine should never join nato now if ukraine joins nato then the entire uh, nato forces can be right next at the russian border so, and russians don't want that so it is russia is looking at its own national security and to thwart any attempt to its national security but how the propaganda plays out is something you know see <clears throat> uh, without naming uh, any country there are multiple countries which exploit you know african nations and they project big human rights things you know elsewhere else. but you go to africa and you will realize which country is the biggest uh, which country is the country which exploits the most you know and uh, to be I, I i won't hesitate in naming but france france maximum colonies in uh, africa today are french colonies so france has exploited african countries like anything but then there is a narrative that we are there for development so that's a hybrid warfare okay remember when you are playing with mind without using weapons but you are taking social media music blogs into account you're shaping somebody else's mind part of hybrid warfare so how do you uh, save yourself save yourself 
uh, from you know social engineering uh, awareness training and education you should know difference between these three it's important okay so there might be a question which says you know you're carrying out uh, <clears throat> a baseline for security understanding in house and uh, you throw out <clears throat> you throw out uh, bulletins from time to time so that employees are aware so what are you carrying out training awareness or education? obviously it's awareness because you're throwing out bulletins it's not compulsory okay training is something which is compulsory you do right right now i am doing is you know training okay i'm training you guys to uh, prepare for cissp so that is targeted you there are very few people in this group right now okay and it is provided in house so we have a platform where we are sitting so in an organization it is provided in house awareness is for everyone everyone should know that they have to you know uh, adhere to the information security policy that the password needs to be changed after 14 days and if there is no password change uh, control then they have to do it themselves okay and verify that yes i have changed my password whereas training is targeted it is has a specific purpose and it is carried out uh, carried out in house questions do figure out from such uh, you know domain and lastly it's education that when uh, you know you seek extensive knowledge you are part of an organization the organization tells you please get a cissp certification it is required for your job profile and it will give you a career boost so what you do you sit down and you know get trained so your corporate hires me and there are 10 people i go and train uh, 10 people from a company education is being imparted to you know carry out or there might be a specific uh, course that company feels is important and it imparts so remember these three these three are important okay and once you have provided awareness training or education you have to constantly evaluate it whether employees are aware employees are trained whether somebody needs to be educated okay you need to constantly evolve this important does figure out okay how do you improve uh, awareness and training uh, improvements you create focus groups so okay say today you create a focus group for uh, social engineering okay you say in our company we will have a social engineering focus group and everyone sits down and focuses that what is required in the company to have uh, you know social engineering how to avoid social engineering and then you uh, create a strategy and create a that focus group now goes and imparts training to or awareness to everyone okay so you create you pick up people from all all uh, verticals or all departments train them on social media so this becomes your social media or social engineering focus group and they go across your company and impart awareness training to everyone awareness and training to everyone you need to constantly change topics so every time if you keep talking about fishing and social media people will get bored change the topic do something physical do activity you know activity based training modern methods like virtual reality get a virtual reality glasses let everyone go through a vr class of 5 minutes each you know game so gaming is another gamification of security is go to hack the box you know beautiful arrangement to learn penetration testing it because it is gamified it is gamified your you know training and education uh, one added concept in this time is security champions which was not there in cissp 1922 which is now there in 20 to 25 is security champion okay so security champions is something so you identify people who have been you know uh, been very good on in the security forum and they have done very well over a period of time in your organization and uh, you say make a you know weekly security champion and you know, honor that person or give that person a task in a week to you know uh, give best use or best way in which you uh, have you know he he, su he supports the security process in the company uh, individuals do get motivated for such things and you know you will get better results uh, one of the major important uh, decisions as a leader as a, as a security leader would be to gauge what is the training effectiveness and training effectiveness is generally calculated by something called TEI training effectiveness indicator how do you assess training effectiveness indicator okay whether your content is reviewed properly okay whether your content is relevant and fresh okay you have a policy on education uh, you 
are able to troubleshoot any personal behavior in a person okay and that's how you create a effective evaluation process okay and these are the training education indicator training effectiveness indicators question might come in but nothing very important okay so as far as uh, this was up to chapter 2 i guess this is where chapter 2 gets over okay and uh, these are the things which you should understand okay so now uh, we will take a small break with this we have finished chapter 1 and chapter 2 of uh, you know uh, cybex after this business continuity and business impact analysis are akin to uh, what we have done in risk, risk management so what happens is now uh, you have seen you have come as a ciso okay and you understood the business objective you created a risk management okay profile and you did security training training and awareness so now you have understood the entire security process okay but now your business has to be available okay this was as far as confidentiality and integrity was concerned okay this is how you maintain confidentiality and integrity of organizational resources but now your organization has to be available for whatever it is to be available and that is where business continuity comes in your business has to be continuous it cannot stop because then on, then it will stop generating revenue so uh, for business continuity uh, you have to understand how business continuity works and next two chapters one chapter basically gives you a way of understanding how business needs to continue and what will be the how to understand to apply the business continuity process okay it is akin to what we do in risk management so it will not take us much time once we finish that then we will try to finish the laws regulation and compliance so my aim is to finish domain one today by 10 30 okay because 11 o'clock i've got my daughter's uh, sports meet <laughs> so i we need to finish today if you are not able to finish we'll finish tomorrow but i'm now with the speed i'm pretty uh, okay that we'll be able to finish this uh, domain one and two by tomorrow okay let's take a small five minutes break and uh, grab a coffee thank you
Okay, so we will start now. Yeah, so now <clears throat> once you've understood that we've done our risk management and other things which we have done over the last three sessions, now it is important to make the business continue its operations. And how do you do that? By understanding what are the business continuity requirements. By business continuity, we mean that what are the <coughs> so by business continuity we mean now the risk management was to assess risks to assets. Okay. Now, which are the assets which are critical? Now, which are the assets which are critical to keep the business running? Okay, is basically understanding what are the business continuity requirements. Okay. Okay. If these assets which are critical, okay, if these critical assets fail, then it will lead to business outage. Now, everything in your organization may not be critical, right? So you have to identify those uh, critical processes, critical assets, which are required for the minimal functioning of the business, that business doesn't go out of business. Even if there is a you know, critical failure, okay, your business should keep on operating, maybe at a reduced scale, maybe at a op may not be at a very optimum so what happens is once such thing happens your speed of your speed of the website might go down but it will not go out of action okay it will never go out of action it will remain so uh, for those who have just joined again i saw a few people joining now so risk management was to carry out and understand the risks to an asset however business continuity is to identify those critical assets failure of which will lead to you know business outage leading to business outage so if you're able to identify them then that is basically doing what is called the business continuity requirements okay so first is to analyze the business continuity requirement okay then analyzing these critical assets you want to analyze those critical assets but what would be its impact if it fails then it is carried out in business impact analysis so one is business continuity requirements. That is the first step. Second, you do is the business impact analysis. Okay. Then, once you have understood what are the critical process, critical assets, what is their impact, then you document it. Okay. Then you document its scope and plan of your business continuity. Okay. And finally, you do planning and exercise put into a training methodology or a exercise to do to to put into perspective as to what will you do if this thing goes wrong okay so how do you plan for business continuity you basically to minimize risk to the organization okay uh, these are the slight points taken straight away from the book okay overall game is to provide a quick calm and efficient response okay and maintain continuous operation. These are the two key keywords. Okay. Business has to continue its mission, mission critical task. Okay. So as I told you uh, a few days back, there was a hack at Ames. Okay. And their entire systems just crashed. And they were able to restore normal functioning without their information system in two days. It took them two to three days. Okay. To restore their normal functioning. But it, but it was subnormal. It, it, it was not up to its full. It's full normality took them almost two weeks. Okay. So that means somewhere they have not done business continuity requirements properly. They have not understood which systems are critical for their functioning. <coughs> and 
you know how to give a quick calm and efficient response even if a disaster if not disaster has struck if even if a disaster strikes you know how to give a quick calm and efficient response and make the mission critical task keep run okay there is not complete disruption there is no complete uh, you know failure of a subsystem or a system okay so that is how you plan for business continuity okay and it involves firstly minimizing risk to the organization and creating policies plans and procedures you need to have a business call continuity plan you need to have business continuity procedures things should not happen that you know if if something has gone wrong in your organization then you're searching for what to do what to do next you're calling your ceo directly whereas there is a business continuity plan there's a fire in your warehouse and you know what to do there are sops in place so you know the first is the first responders go try to take out the fire the fire is too big the too big then secondary responders come wherein you give a call to the you know uh, fire uh, the the government bodies for fire extinguishing and they come in fire brigade comes in but you have to still maintain operation so there is a standby uh, warehouse from where functions uh, operations continue and it has little impact on the business you know so okay your master warehouse is stopped but your secondary warehouse is under operation if you take it to information systems you have master slave arrangement so what will happen is you probably have a load balancer and it is pointing to your primary production line okay and this is your secondary production line this might have a reduced scale okay and this might have a full scale so you everything is working here fine fine but some error comes in there's auto switch over or a minimal time lapse in which there's a switch over and this becomes green so these are called what blue green arrangements if somebody has been in a production architecture these are called blue green arrangements a typical blue green arrangement is controlled by a switch okay not a physical switch not a electrical switch a switch it such switch can be a load balancer a switch can be a traffic diverter a switch can be even a concentrator so you can you know divert the data to the <coughs> this is not this is part kind of high availability yes this is part of high availability but this is not a typical high availability what i am saying is if you have catered for business continuity then high availability becomes part of a business continuity plan of course okay these are th that is a overlap there is a overlap right <clears throat> so what is the business continuity planning steps planning steps uh, so you got something called project scope and planning you carry out business impact analysis you got continue plan continuity planning and you approve the plan and implement the plan okay so this is the business continuity planning steps so you, we saw we had four requirements we have to do business continuity planning okay we have to do business impact analysis so first part of business continuity planning when you say bcp okay bcp has four steps that is what is the scope of the plan what is the business impact ana analysis scope is to basically work out the assets okay the critical assets then you carry out a business impact analysis to quantify which is your most critical assets okay and what will be the impact if that asset fails and then you implement up continuity planning how do you do continuity planning by giving them resources so if you provide resources because if there is a system which goes out of action then you need another system okay to continue to continue that means for business continuity you will always re require additional resources you may bring it online in a matter of minutes maybe possible but always business continuity continuity requires additional provisioning and resources and once we have made a plan you get the plan approved from a senior hierarchy and get it implemented okay <clears throat> so what happens in a business continuity is step 1 is that is project scope and planning is you first need a team okay so you form a team that team carries out the organizational review okay okay so it carries out okay what are the requirements how does the organization for same in you know, a business continuity we said business objective requirements here you do organizational review as to okay why do we require business continuity so we identify that okay we are a website 
which is a digital uh, platform for selling okay so we are amazon okay and we know that our website needs to be uptime uptime is 100% but we cannot maintain 100% if we want to maintain 100% what is the implications okay so we realize that our main business once we do an organization review we understand uh, the organization which maintains our, our sub organizations or verticals which maintain this website are the key critical so we understand that is our critical process okay. and our business needs to be saved because uh, this is our primary business because because of this customers come on the portal buy things and that is how we get revenue okay so we form a business team we, we, we carry out a bcp team selection so what we do know okay we have it team okay we have a sourcing team which sources the material and puts it we have a design team we have an infra team okay and we have a marketing team we have a sales team okay so we pick guys from each important and former business continuity planning team because these are the key stakeholders in running this particular product and we also try to get somebody from the upper management okay why once we get somebody from the upper management it gives you value okay so we 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 form this team and once we have formed this team so bcp team gets formed okay then what does it do it ties to an analyze the assets which are critical okay so you can bring out the assets so we we brought out that this website is critical this needs to function out of this we have created this sub process this sub process this sub process and this sub process are important is the amazon warehouse critical for them at this point in time it's a back end we don't so it is priority too sorry so maybe the website i list out that i list out that website is priority one warehouse is priority two and third is the robots which are working in the uh, warehouse who move the product and put it on the you know uh, dispatch line are priority three say this is just a vague example i gave right so website so bcp team selected that these are the three assets and this is the prioritization okay once it is prioritized now i do a business impact analysis so i calculate what first of all i calculate the asset value okay i calculate the asset value so i get out okay website is evaluated at 100 million dollars outage of this will be the biggest what is the costing of the warehouse okay warehouse is costing around you know 20 million dollars because it's holding stores worth 20 million at any point in time and it is priority two for me because i have uh, even if the warehouse goes down i have a secondary regional warehouse i have a secondary but for me critical is the website website should keep running okay because website generates the uh, uh, maximum amount of value and third is the robots which move the line those robots are priority three what is their asset value okay each robot cost me around twenty thousand dollars okay so now i've carried out asset value uh, analysis and then i analyze what will be the impact so what i do i calculate the sle okay of so sle is single loss expectancy so if my website goes down if my asset value is 100 million and uh, single loss expectancy is 10 million okay that means if my site goes down once if there's outage of one hour okay so that means exposure factor ef is say one hour which is say 0.1 okay just giving you a mathematical figure so if my site goes down for one once it causes me a revenue loss of 10 million usd okay and then i calculate and I, I i i have a factor of aro which says that this event happens you know three times in a year so three times in a year means 30 million dollar revenue loss because uh, ale is equal to sle into aro okay so i am losing 30 million dollars if three times my website goes down in a 
here for 24 hours each okay so now for me priority one is my website therefore in my in my bia okay my p1 is website and similarly i do for uh, warehouse and the robots okay and that is how i arrive that for me website is the most important okay so i do a quantitative analysis once i've done that then i assess what are the resources required for keeping my website up and bringing that ale from 3 to point one then my uptime is 99 point you know nine okay so now this is my task i have to bring down my loss from 30 million dollars to point one equivalent million dollars okay so that means my website can go uh you know earlier it was going three times down now it can go only point one time because that is what the requirement is above this you know uh, it will be a business, huge business loss that's why now if it has to be got down to point one so we realize that it team needs to be developed the the uh, infrastructure need, team needs to be doubled up back-end infrastructure needs to be doubled up there has to be a parallel infrastructure so there is going to be a cost involved for business continuity okay so you understand that there also might be a point where you might be legally and regulatory requirements to be met. So suppose you were not a Amazon site, but a uh, you were a bank, okay? And people wanted to withdraw money during the business hours, and your website went down and ca causing loss to the uh, you know business houses. Is there any regulatory or legal requirement? To continue in in strict regulatory requirements like suppose you are a electricity provider you're a water supply provider for you business continuity is provide providing water 100 percent of the time electricity 100 percent of the time okay or some critical you're an oxygen cylinder provider oxygen provider to a hospital okay or you are gas provider to household your business cannot go down because if your business goes down people will end up without food or without oxygen hospitals will land so that, that that is the kind of regulatory requirement you have to keep in mind so you carry out an organizational review okay uh, these are the standard lines i've already we have already spoken about it okay you work out what are the departments what are the crit critical support systems you require which are the security teams okay and you carry out a uh, organizational review okay uh, this is generally at times if it is an IT specific business continuity, it may be given to a IT leader. Okay, and further analysis of the organization review is done by the BCP team. Okay, how do you select the BCP team? I already discussed. You can select it from all the specific, uh, you know, uh, departments. But senior management role is very critical, and such questions always figure out on CISSP. That you found a very beautiful business continuity but your business continuity somehow failed what could be a major reason for business continuity failure and you will realize they're written that senior management though was part of it but you know it does not actively support the business continuity but all three rest three answers will be when you are doing business all three answers will look very very good but if there is no senior management support critical tasks like risk management security management will are likely to fail okay you see organizations where uh, senior management is not in support you will see likely those programs have failed okay so this could be the likely uh, 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 team okay it is selected from all critical teams and then you carry out what are the resource requirements for uh, you know uh, the bc the business continuity itself okay you might you might uh, need certain additional resources. So if you want to test uh, that if that website goes down, what will happen? You might require certain additional resources. So you have to make those resources available to the business continuity team to carry out business continuity planning. This is not about uh, the resources required for creating the business continuity plan. This is what BCP team might require to carry out a business continuity uh, planning and implementation okay so uh, 
what happens is generally in business continuity is you earmark resources there might be resources there it have been issued there but you don't touch them it is kept as a reserve or kept as a standby in your organization but you do earmark those hardware and software in your organization okay but you need to test those you need to have a business continuity testing you need to drill you need to carry out drills as to if you have to work out contingencies okay if there is a fire in your organization and that's why you see you have fire drills in your organization okay at times you places where it is earthquake prone you will have earthquake specific drills like in japan they have a lot of earthquake specific drills now a uh, lot of coastal areas carry out the tsunami drills okay so these are few drills which are very specific uh, organizations which are dependent on electricity they carry out you know power out outage drills organizations which are heavily dependent on cloud they these days carry out cloud outage drills so they create some part of their business functioning on on premise uh, you know arrangements uh, like we were discussing yesterday if if what what if you know uh, so recently i think this year only us east one went down in in aws okay so us east one has all the major services of aws running on it okay and uh, once us east one went down uh, in fact google's lot of services went down because there were a lot of interrelated api dependencies which would have gone down so what happens is uh, there was a cascade of failures a lot of websites went out for almost 24 hours so that's a critical failure yeah that was a critical failure. and if organizations have not uh, understood that and have not created uh, resiliency in their plans uh, your business continuity might be an issue okay so you do carry out bcp compulsorily in a lot of regulated environments so if you are a hospital you need to carry out certain uh, you know uh, bcp plans so yeah, today we saw you know prime minister modi giving out that 27th we are going to have a drill for you know nationwide drill for uh, covid preparedness so it's kind of a you know continuity bcp plan so what is the bcp for the nation to have a continuity we know that it was a major uh, failure in the second wave so to test the efficacy we are doing a small drill to understand whether all our procedures play, plans are in place or not okay then you have to understand the legal requirements and legal and regulatory requirements that are required to uh, fulfill if you are working in a regulatory framework environment okay now you have for business continuity you have made a team and you have made the resources but now you have to understand what's the impact of uh, a disaster on your assets okay business impact analysis is same to what we did in quantitative and qualitative analysis okay it is exactly same you carry out this is the heart of the process you can carry it out in two manner it can be carried out quantitatively and qualitatively okay how do you carry out uh, and before that you need to identify what are the you know critical uh, processes which are likely to cause you a failure okay how do you process it okay so you firstly identify the business priorities so you once you've identified the business priority you identify its asset value this is what we know how to find out asset value and we found out that the website had uh, you know uh, an asset value of 100 million uh, million dollar now what happens is now there are four key things which you need to know that first is maximum tolerable downtime okay maximum tolerable downtime is generally it's a historical data okay and uh, so what happens is your system is functioning okay the system is functioning well and this is the point at which the failure happens okay and your process is such so good that you are able to recover this process in a particular time frame okay and this is your maximum tolerable downtime to so say this time is 2 hours okay so if you are able to recover your system within this time this is mtd okay this is mtd if you are able to recover your system within this time 
that means you have been successful you've been able to successfully ca carry out your business continuity plan okay so this is the key objective that if you are able to sustain recover your process or business in the within the minimum maximum tolerable time uh, maximum tolerable downtime then you have been successful in executing your bcp plan now there are two things which come out from it one is recovery time objective and one is recovery point objective now if you are if you are a data centric uh, you know business rpo is the maximum data loss that you can take okay so you have to revive those systems within that time frame so if this is your maximum tolerable downtime and this is your rpo this is called recovery point objectives okay and so if above this point if your uh, if organization suffers any further data loss you know you will not be able to recover the data therefore your recovery point objective should always be lesser than recovery time objective because beyond this your company will not be able to recover this data okay so this is your recovery point objective so you should always try to recover your systems within this time the critical data loss systems should be recovered in this time remember this if your systems are not recovered then you will have data loss taking place okay so this is what i have explained so uh, your maximum tolerable downtime you should you should recover your systems within maximum tolerable downtime okay so this is what it is shown which i have drawn i think so rpo your rpo should be less than the rto and together this is the uh, maximum tolerable downtime so this this is the time where system fails and if you are able to recover your system here then you have recovered the data and then you recover balance of the systems okay but beyond this you will have a data loss okay therefore organizations do mention rpo okay in their doc documentation and you have to recover uh, critical data uh, systems which are dependent on data uh, data loss you have to recover your systems within that time frame okay okay so how do you identify risks now risks are of many types okay risks can be natural risks man made risk and uh, you have to identify those risks now there are times you know very simple questions do figure out in cisss to identify what kind of risk are that and you should be very uh, you should be able to identify those those are simple uh, marks marks gainers and you should be able to take those okay and how do you carry out sle and ale of natural risk or man made risk that is supposed to be uh, i'll tell you how to do that okay now generally for earthquakes lightning storms these data are generally available with the uh, uh with the with departments which hold such data okay so you might have earthquake department which hold the data of how many times the earthquake has happened in a period of 100 years or how many storms do happen in a particular area so then you can take out you can make out what is the risk to a system from natural disasters okay then you do a likelihood assessment how how many times a, a earthquake will happen in this area so suppose you are planning to create a data center in in delhi so uh, before you do that the risk management team will definitely find out how many times earthquake takes place whether it's a low lying area where is there is the chances of flood because nobody would like to have a data center in a flood prone area okay earthquake is still manageable flood is something which is not manageable okay so you uh, calculate such data from uh, business uh, historical data so you will get you will get to know that how much is the likelihood of earthquake in a particular place okay then you calculate the sle as i told you i explained then you first thing is the calculate the sle and calculate the ale so you have identified the asset you calculate its its single loss expectancy that which you are aware one time it happens say 10 million dollars so annually it happens you know three times so 30 million dollars okay but you might have qualitative uh, 
uh, uh, things also to be analyzed. So if you realize that Amazon website went out for 24 hours, what will be the reputation loss? Huge. Okay. So there will be backup systems will, which will kick in. At times you do see Amazon websites going slow, Amazon crashing on you know Black Friday sale or something like that. Okay. So you might have uh, such things. Uh, recently, uh, Twitter faced a lot of employee outgo. So there was a reputation loss to Twitter because of Elon Musk coming in. So you have to understand these impact and how to, you know, if uh, if such uh, unprecedented things happen. Okay. So the, you have to evaluate these things once you are doing an impact analysis. And then you do a resource prioritization as to what is the resource that would be uh, required for business continuity. So if you have analyzed that your website is premium, what is the backend? What do you require for making that backend functional even at critical failures? You will be able to give out based on your quantitative and qualitative analysis, which we've already done in risk manner. Okay. And then your last task is to uh, next task is to uh, how to have a uh, you know continuity planning. So how to make the you have now allocated resources. You have identified what was the risk, what is the uh, value of the risk, what are uh, what is the inherent priority, and now you would like to have a co continuity strategy in place. And that's why you uh, create a small strategy for uh, business continuity to happen, and then you give the resources required that are. Uh, required for making your that critical asset keep running okay <laughs> so what do you do in the strategy development you carry out rto rpo so you so you now identified the asset okay and after you identified the asset you now lay down that what will be the maximum tolerable downtime what will be the rto and what will be the rp and what will be the strategy for recovery strategy for recovery okay once you have done this, you have created a small strategy for keeping your critical asset live even in critical disaster. Okay. And then you uh, say that for keeping this critical asset alive, what do you require? You require that critical people are there in their place when this disaster strikes. The facilities which are required keep operating and the infrastructure which is required, okay, it is operating. So these three, they are available and operating. These are available and operating. And these are available and operating. OK. And how do you make it? So the people in your organization are the most important part. Their life is always important. So as per CISSP, whenever you see such questions, OK, where life is a threat, priority is life. OK. So if you are in a organization where fire has happened and your business has to continue but life life of people is at risk then the biggest asset is people okay you have to safeguard nothing is more precious than life your life has been safeguarded 100 million in revenue can go okay so remember that yeah and uh, one of the prime learnings teachings of CISSP is life is to be valued life is of uh, you know life is of life is the most uh, important asset then how do you keep your facilities going? You harden it. You have alternate sites. Okay. For if you if you need a day, additional data center, you might have an alternate data center. Uh, your infrastructure might require certain hardening against. If you have analyzed that earthquake is your biggest risk, then you would like to have certain hardening systems for your data center, and you might have certain alternate systems. Uh, you know, alternate arrangements for your systems which are required for your critical functions to operate okay? and this are this, these are the provisions you give okay and once you have created that plan ensure that that plan is approved by the senior hierarchy okay if a ceo signs your bcp plan then you will see that it gains a lot of traction in your company and then uh, that plan gets implemented now how do you implement a bcp plan you basically document you create procedures and plans okay you train people and then you then people know that if there is a disaster which happens then uh, who to contact which document to open how to 
called the secondary services like fire brigade in case of a fire okay and how to get out of that critical disaster, disaster incident which has happened and once you have done all this you need to create the documentation as i say in security whatever you do you need to document so if you have create a business continuity plan and you have assess what are the risks what are the assets what is the impact analysis what is the maximum tolerable downtime what are the provisions and processes who are the critical people who is going to manage what you need to put it out in a document and what are those documents those are continuity planning goals statement of importance statement of priorities and statement of organization responsibility okay these things are supposed to be included in your bcp i generally nobody will ask this but you should generally know the uh, nobody will ask you what are the steps of bcp okay uh, these are just referred steps you should know again the, the way you do risk management in business continuity you should know that there is a business continuity team which selects the which lays down the strategy does a business impact analysis based on quantitative and qualitative analysis and then does implement the plan and does a training and does a documentation these are the broad steps you should important okay? and this is to basically tell you that tomorrow if you are involved in the business continuity what you can go through okay always take out a signature of the ceo in a statement of importance so you have a cover letter covering letter which says this business continuity plan is thereby circulated and it carries important weightage so departments will do give weightage to that document okay and business continuity is uh, you know organization responsibility from senior to everybody uh, down to the bottom it is everybody's responsibility and finally once you have done all that you up, get the approval plan approval done and you implement the solution and how do you implement the solution so you again we go to uh, you know we do exercises we do trainings okay and we've done our risk assessment we understand that what are the uh, key uh, key key assets and we implement it by doing exercises okay by identifying assets which are important and we again do a risk assessment and see okay whether controls need to be implemented or not okay so if controls need to be implemented then we implement the controls and reduce the risk of any any critical uh, process going out so if we know that uh, our systems need additional protection then we carry out that protection okay. so that is what is business continuity generally is all about now there is a very important aspect it's called vital records program now in organizations you will see that uh, at times uh, there are critical records which needs to be stored and backed up and uh, you have a vital records uh, program where you uh, lay out uh, where firstly where they are located where are the vital records located okay suppose a incident takes up takes place and you need to know where are the vital records located okay and whether they are backed up or not okay and how to protect them how to protect them if you have been able to do understand this then you will be able to uh, protect your key uh, documents which are important uh, within your organization now the challenge is identifying vital records you should be able to identify what are the uh, vital records in your organization and how you would like to uh, you know uh, keep them or archive them or protect them so uh, once this is done you generally uh, create emergency response guidelines okay so what you do is you create a emergency response guidelines that okay if a disaster strikes in an organization who will do what okay and uh, who are the first responders going to be and uh, what if the disaster is of such a value that it cannot be contained within the organization with the organizational procedures and you have to take state help wherein a fire brigade is required or ambulance is required so those lists should be available and 
the business continuity who serve the business continuity team who has implemented it knows uh, if if suppose some some disaster strikes at a time when nobody is there and there's only minimum critical team remaining so out of the team also who is going to respond if some uh, critical emergency takes place those such sops need need to be there in critical functions okay and that's why the those documents are supposed to be maintained and are supposed to be reflected in job description that you will be responsible for business continuity management okay and once you've implemented the business continuity uh, 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 you have implemented these uh, emergency response guidelines and you are maintaining this documentation final is you have to continually test and exercise so a six monthly exercise or a yearly business continuity exercise is carried out in organizations as per either as per regulatory requirement or as a good practice okay and with this element we've come to the end of uh, uh, business continuity planning if you have any doubts let's uh, clarify those doubts yes yeah, subjit i have a doubt in where do we see this disaster recovery and business continuity plan is this a uh, subset of that and uh, is this a temporary bcp is a temporary if any uh, disaster comes uh, no, how no, no, dr and uh, bcp fits where, no, no. where do they fit okay so business continuity and dr are two different processes okay business continuity is the critical critical assets which need to require for normal business process okay so suppose a earthquake strikes suppose a earthquake strikes now where disaster recovery and business continuity has to come in i'm telling you so suppose a earthquake strikes and there is a interruption in business and there are certain nominal actions which need to take place to keep your business in continuity okay now whether those plans procedures exist or not is part of business continuity so this was natural disaster i'll tell you a man made disaster okay you are operating a website and there's a dos attack which takes place okay and at a critical point in time dos attack takes place when christmas leave everybody is on leave everybody is enjoying and that is the time this attack takes place either a dos attack takes place or a, a sql injection takes place some attack takes place okay is there any critical uh, so you have identified the team which will respond okay have you identified that team so you, you if you are a product manager and there is a security manager is there a business continuity plan which takes place into account that on the christmas holidays definitely our website will be you know visited by hackers hackers will try to exploit us because they know that this is the time we are most vulnerable our security teams are on leave our maintenance teams are on leave we are working at the more, minimum uh manpower okay so this is the lax time this is the best time to attack a particular organization fine now you as uh, say senior executor you have carried out a business continuity plan and you say hey listen this weekend is going to be very difficult because this is the time when maximum teams are on leave and this is the time we can expect maximum amount of hackers trying to do something funny so these are the critical assets which do require to function and then there is a business continuity plan you create that this is the minimum manpower requirement this is the minimum resource requirement for this particular task to continue effectively even if at a downgraded scale okay at this point in time and if created a temporary business continuity plan for this these 3 days or 7 days okay this is a short term okay okay view second second view of business continuity is i know that my systems when they perform at 100% they perform very well but when suddenly due to certain uh, unwanted things like network interruption or network outage or increased load my systems even if they perform at 70% uh, 70% they will be able to take the load now to make the systems perform at that 70% level what are the resources minimum resources i require okay how do i process them how do i provision them is part of business continuity now where disaster recovery come into picture is if there is a serious disaster happen okay there is a flood and it takes out your complete data center then it cannot be part of business continuity because business cannot continue only imagine your data center which was part of say tsunami 2002 
ہمیں جیسا نام یو گیٹ فرڈ یو ہیو نو چوائس بٹ دین یو ہیو اے ڈیزاسٹر ریکوری پلان ویئر ان یو سیٹ دیٹ اوکے دیر از اے رسک آف ٹوینٹی پرسینٹ دیٹ ارتھ کوئک ول اسٹرائک یو نو مائی ڈیٹا سینٹر ان ڈیلی اف اٹ اسٹرائکس دین مائی آلٹرنیٹ سائٹ وچ از ان ممبئی ول اسٹارٹ فنکشننگ آئی ٹیک دا روڈ ایٹ اے ریڈیوسڈ اسکیل that is disaster recovery you have recovered everything which was there at the delhi center center to uh, mumbai now for disaster recovery to happen generally in information systems there is a parallel replication okay so what happens whatever data is there in the delhi data center will get replicated to the mumbai data center and when the disaster strike you have to see how much data loss has happened and with is that data loss within your recovery point objective understood okay understood so business continuity is to keep the business critical functions alive disaster recovery is to recover from a major disaster but yeah. bo- both uh, objectives are to continuity uh, for business continuity only Is both like? uh, both are, yes both are both are majority in business continuity but disaster recovery is not actually business continuity disaster recovery is to recover from a major disaster okay business okay. continuity is to keep continuing even in case a major or a minor disaster strikes because disaster recovery will require you to allocate resources which you cannot allocate in business continuity business continuity is to recover from small business interruptions interruptions okay not big disasters big disasters you will probably have to replicate your systems okay okay yeah so we'll take a small break uh, 10 minutes break take a coffee and uh, we are going fast today and we will finish laws regulations and compliance in some time thank you Yes, sir, Madhya, raise your hand. 
Uh, yes, sir. हाँ बता. So, so I also had the I also had the same query on the lines of Chaya. I think BC, yeah. the difference between BCP and DR. So uh, I understood. So one just one query uh, around DR. So uh, even for DR, we uh, have a separate setup for, for critical processes only, right? Or do we have do no, we no, DR? DR is a disaster. What is a disaster? If your website went down for ten minutes, is it a disaster? No, no. Uh, but wherever your infrastructure for your website is hosted, suppose your company is, uh, you know. Uh, Your company backend is a bank, but the business comes out from the portal. Okay, any bank, right? Today, all the banks have their infrastructure, also physical infrastructure, but everything happens online, right? But suppose you're uh, uh, in your headquarters where your key infrastructure is there, and a big earthquake happens, or something like World Trade Center disaster happens, where you know there's a strike, or say a big flood comes in and fills in your data center. What do you do? do you have any process at that time you cannot say hey i need to implement my business continuity plan at that time you will say bhaiya i have to recover from disaster this is a disaster which has happened okay this is no more a bcp plan this is now the state government has to get involved the the big people have to kick in business continuity is to ensure that interruption in the business are handled well and you provision resources in disaster recovery you will have if you are planning for disaster recovery you will have parallel systems in action so what happens hmm. is you know if aws us east one goes down then it knows that that data center is out of action it needs to move the complete operations to the alternate site right. okay so there will be a massive massive process and that's why when disaster strikes there is going to be a major outage but if In, if you are having a inter, if you are having a interruption and there is a major major outage means you have not catered for business continuity plan so if your systems go out and are not able to recover because of small incidences okay that means you have not catered for business continuity planning but if a major disaster strikes and you have business continuity in place you might survive okay you might survive you may not have to take disaster recovery into cognizance because you had beautiful business continuity plans you survived a major disaster but not vice versa mm -hmm. got it so uh, no no so what i was actually, i understood this uh, so it has to be at different different geographical locations and etc but uh, my query was if all the 100% is replicated or there are there is also some identity there might be there might be business loss in a disaster there might be okay so that's why you give a, a rto you give a recovery point objective in business continuity in disaster recovery you don't generally give a rto in disaster recovery you have to recover from a major disaster you have mm -hmm. to protect lives you have to protect your infrastructure you have to protect your business okay that time protection becomes important okay obviously the aim of business continuity and disaster relief are the same but disaster is a bigger at scale business continuity plan is to handle small interruptions small. in the business by identifying critical assets that is something which you need to understand okay okay yeah and, and you were asking okay um, so just one thing so this difference this point is also given in the book as well actually and if okay. we go by the language like so this is also explained like it says this is the difference of perspective only both activities yeah. help prepare an organization for a disaster only and the intent is to keep the operations running continuously business continuity planning is from high level uh, like from strategically strategic perspective from or for an organization and disaster recovery is a more technical plan uh, but like uh, like uh, you know de describe the technical and tactical activities such as recovery yeah. sites backup you know dis di disaster recovery would be more uh, you know what you end up doing to create yeah. the business yeah. act but once you talk about business continuity business continuity is keeping the uh, you know uh, so they are both they are both hand in hand but when we talk about business continuity see disasters don't happen every day okay once you say disasters disasters is something which is uh, which which is once in a while which you cannot be predicted but business continuity interruptions can be predicted right you can predict that network outage will be a uh, case you might predict uh, you know 
on uh, holidays the traffic will go down on uh, you know uh, on the, you know something like covid was cannot be predicted and covid made a lot of institutions actually put disaster recovery procedures into action because people were not going to a production site people are not going to so what did you do organization which had a beautiful bcp plan ready they just moved to remote but all the organizations which were which were not remote ready faced a lot of issues they, they it took some it took them some time to understand how to you know uh, move their businesses online uh, people who needed uh, organizations which needed people to come on floor and work car manufacturing manufacturing industry suffered a lot they never they probably never thought that there could be something like a lockdown and two months people will not work and that's why businesses you, know, you see the recession coming in the prime reason is because manufacturing has gone down people have lost their jobs no money so that's why recession is happening so this is disaster striking the website going down for a server crashing is not a disaster it's a it's a business interruption and you have a stand by for that server and you patch it up okay yeah uh so sir i understood this so my actually query was uh, like how we do a business impact analysis uh, to identify critical uh, pro uh, processes and uh, assets the, the, so do we do the same for dr the or, same uh, thing the, no, no exactly dr uh, that's what uh, dr is no see dr is part of see how you business continuity ident asset identification you do in a similar manner in which you do uh, asset value evaluation how did you have to do asset value evaluation you says okay fine i have the list of assets now business continuity team sits down and see these are all theoretical concepts so you have to understand this theoretically in an organization it might happen differently okay uh, since you are you are you are with ey and you are working in grc you will see a lot of this so some organization will carry out a great amount of you know uh, thought thought into it and they will identify critical systems and they will list it down in a document okay you will have a beautiful book or a beautiful uh, you know document on their uh, application online which says that these are the critical assets these are the uh, what are the business interruptions that might happen if these business interruptions happen who is going to handle what okay the way in which you do a risk management is the similar manner in which you do a business continuity asset identification prioritization the proce procedure is same but here you are more focused towards the critical assets here you are not trying to identify all assets here the business continuity team sits down from all departments and analyzes okay what is the minimum required to keep the business continuous okay let's identify that let's identify what are the business interruptions and what are the critical assets which are required to for the business to keep functioning if that is done then you do that ale and uh, you know uh, you do sle you do the same analysis and you quantify or qualify a resource okay the procedure is same but the context is different in risk management you are identifying all assets in business continuity you are identifying business critical assets okay you should do the same quantitative analysis you do the same qualitative analysis you create the same prioritization matrix priority 1 priority 2 priority 3 and now you allocate resources or the provision for that critical asset to function okay yes i got it got it Okay. uh one more query that i had was uh, i have heard about this near site and dr, DR is uh, it has to be at a different geographic location so that will come uh, when we, near, that will, yeah the, so those are those are specific uh, yeah dr sites na? okay yeah. so what is near near ask, site ask. Uh, near site and all what okay near, near site yeah yeah i thought okay. it is about uh, bcp so that's why i asked it's okay yeah fine i'll tell you what is the near site and uh, the far site uh okay you are from mumbai right where in mumbai sakina ka okay anyway let's 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 go. any place right juhu for that matter uh if your primary site and your dr site are located on the same street and flood happens can you reach your dr site no 
if you are not able to reach your p- primary site then how do, how are you going to reach your dr site so dr site will never be on the same state as primary site so your dr site is generally physically a little apart a uh, geographically apart but these are for big corporations a small organization will never have okay and that's why now do you do dr in cloud okay so your primary center is running in a physical data center but your disaster recovery is running in cloud okay your primary data center is running in primary business is running in cloud but your disaster recovery is running in uh, physical data center at a reduced scale understanding the concept that's from where near sight and far sight comes so now uh, till such time people are not into cloud what they used to do if if your primary data center is in mumbai then your secondary data center is in nasik okay so that you are not affected by floods so uh, all financial houses uh, their primary data centers of if you are in mumbai uh, none of the data centers are in mumbai by the way all their primary data centers are either in nasik or or, or some other some other place else i i am aware of one of them rbi rbi's primary data center is in nasik and not in mumbai okay sbi primary center uh, uh, primary data center is in i guess nasik Hyderabad. not in. no primary dc is i think earlier as uh, so until such time i was dealing with sbi the the primary dc was managed by infosys in nasik rbi's primary dc is in nasik okay maybe it's now in hyderabad but but i think i guess infosys only manages them so uh, what i'm saying is the corporate headquarters is in mumbai but everyone knows that mumbai is prone to floods and not a single data center exists in uh, uh, mumbai these days okay everybody has moved to uh, now look at gurgaon people are moving their data centers out from gurgaon to noida why no, gurgaon goes under floods every year despite having all the corporate houses there okay so these are the things you keep in mind and generally when you plan dr site you keep natural disasters in mind okay yeah okay shall we go ahead yes i got it sir thank you okay okay now let's go to regulations and compliance i don't think it will take much time i will just give you where to how to understand and keep in mind what to apply where in which question okay rest you have must have read in the chapters okay these laws regulation and compliance whatever laws are facing they are us specific laws because isc square is concentrated on us and eu primarily okay that's why not too many questions come out specific to laws but how they apply is what they are okay so you should know what is criminal law what is civil law and what is administrative law important one question will definitely come so criminal law is basically to keep the society safe okay so that is the key word you keep the society safe how you you give powers to police and law enforcement agencies to so prohibitions against heinous crime so it is against heinous crime murder assault rape robbery arson okay and penalties up to death and deprivation of civil liberty by going into prison okay what is civil law so once you start, so there was initially only criminal law and then you realize the criminal law cannot address all the problems of a society okay there might be a dispute between two people regarding financial dispute land related dispute you know agreement related to contract related dispute so over a period of time it was understood that criminal law cannot address all the aspects of society to maintain peace and order in the society and to resolve disputes in a society you require civil law so civil law looks into generally disputes okay and it gives executives to carry out their tasks and responsibilities okay so if you have taxation laws if you have cleanliness laws if you have environmental laws they already generally perform part of civil law now what happens is administrative law is administrative laws are those laws which help government in functioning okay so now covid has happened you need to implement a you know curfew then you put a administrative law in place you put crpc section 144 or in us there might be something else in in some country there might be something else but these are the laws which 
help government in functioning okay and this these cannot be covered by criminal and civil law okay so these might be executive orders so covid happens you need to implement a lockdown so the collector of the district or the mayor of the district the district gives out a executive order that for next 14 days there will be complete lockdown nobody will move out of the house to maintain essential services uh you know vehicles will be provided and food will be distributed to the home so these are administrative laws these are executive orders given to uh, the federal agencies to carry out a effective functioning very important questions does figure out so you need to identify whether it falls in the criminal purview the civil purview or the administrative purview okay so in this chapter we will understand how information security and legal frameworks they both you know gel with each other now the first amongst them is the computer crime laws so i have i have starred them starred means these are the ones which are important and are generally asked okay so we will be going through these uh, few laws which are primarily us laws okay out of which which do get asked in the uh, exam and you know so first was the computer fraud and abuse act 1994 okay how to remember 1994 okay so what is its applicability applicability is even malicious code that might have damage a computer system okay so if you are doing any fraud by providing a malicious code which might damage a, a computer system then you will can be charged under computer fraud and abuse act okay even computers which will are used for interstate commerce so as you know uh, like we we in india have states us also have states and their states have much more uh, bigger governance states themselves are almost at par with countries that you know the state has their own laws okay so even so since their state have their own laws anything which is involved in interstate commerce you know uh, this law is applicable to that gives you imprisonment okay and there are multiple amendments carried out to uh, computer fraud and abuse act so the question generally comes which was the first law which looked into computer was then you will know that it is first law was computer fraud and abuse act remember that introduced in 1994 never generally such questions are asked but in some way it might figure out okay then came the first amendment to uh, you know uh, computer fraud uh, and uh, abuse act okay which increased the threshold from $1000 to $5000 no need to remember this will not be asked ever Okay. you should just know that cfaa was introduced in 1994 okay so uh, prior to cfaa there was comprehensive crime control act which was used to uh, you know uh, address computer crime but once cfaa came in it addressed computer crime specifically now what it is followed it 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 addresses the following unauthorized access to federal systems remember this whether it is financial information whether it is access whether it is fraud whether it is damage whether it is medical records anything related to federal system is covered by cfaa so if you see the first computer crime act which addressed federal systems you see the word federal and first computer crime act so you know it is cc cfaa okay remember this. this is how you know generally we remember threshold of damage nobody will ask okay no need, no point of remembering then there are certain amendments carried out in uh, 1996 this is important that what was the amendment carried out to cfa to cover national infrastructure so national infrastructure was covered under cfa in 1996 okay so that is n i i p a nipa okay so nipa So CFA federal system so NIPA infrastructure. This is all you need to remember. Okay, so map that. So you map it how CFA federal system. So NIPA national infrastructure. Okay, so if you see a question of national infrastructure, you say okay NIPA. That is how you eliminate questions and answers. Okay, okay now what happens was. you created cfa you cre created nipa but now judges were oldies and they didn't know how to actually understand technology so they created something called federal sentencing guidelines for the judges so judges 
were given certain guidelines as to how to assess whether you have done right or wrong okay so this was released for judges to interpret computer crime if you see into this and from there one of the most important thing that may get asked and is asked generally asked is the prudent person's rule okay so what is prudent person's rule prudent person's rule is that there is an incident took which took place whether crime or known not i don't know but you took actions which are evidently due care okay to show that you have taken due care in that situation okay if that is due care has been done then you will not be charged okay so if senior executives take personal responsibility for ensuring due care so you know something happened in your organization you you got hacked and there was a lawsuit on you and which says that senior organization senior representative should be uh, you know uh, reprimanded or should be jailed or should be given but then once you go and then you are able to prove that you took all your precautions you had a good risk management in place you were you take good due care and some you know uh, apt has been able to successfully perpetrate a crime which for which you are not responsible you said you have taken but then apts are much more you know uh, uh, sophisticated and we were not able to thwart the attack this time they attacked the same time and we were able to thwart it but the 11th time is something which we couldn't take care we 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 couldn't do despite our having all controls in place that means you have taken due care you have stopped them 10 times 11th time you were not able to and you are not at fault so the judges will say okay fine prudent person rule they have taken the right decision if you are able to prove due diligence and due care in all situations so suppose to become you tomorrow you go in a framework tomorrow you rise up in your career and you go at a place if you are able to prove due diligence and due care then generally legally you are safe okay remember that it's a, there will be times at there will be times uh, this thing will uh, uh, so what happened with uber right uber ciso he actually tried to suppress uh, the hack okay and he has done same tries and fourth time he got caught and he is in jail because he was not he was shown seen to be not taken due diligence and due care in and that led to leakage of personal info which comes under one of the uh, laws uh, us privacy act okay so <laughs> there the individual was personally responsible because he tried to hide the negligence hide the departmental negligence okay he tried to hide the fact that they got hacked and that's why he was taken to jail okay but had he communicated to that they have got hacked like you see last pass the day got they got hacked thrice by the way in last three months and still people are not talking about it because everybody understands that you might get hacked some day you might get hacked but what are the controls you have taken in place what is the communications in order okay whether you have been due diligent due care then it goes on okay so there are prudent person rule you should remember you should be due diligent and you should have been legally you should have seen that you have not been negligent towards you know uh, uh, imparting security controls in your organization so if you are able to prove these three then you are generally safe and these are the three rules given to the judges and that was federal sentencing guidelines so if you see a question what should tick click your mind okay federal uh, uh, the guidelines issued to judges in the us to you know understand computer crimes and give give appropriate relief or pass judgment then federal sentencing guideline should click in your mind okay the next act was federal information security management act fisma it is four star so it is generally this gets asked okay most of the people whom i have spoken they generally had a question in fisma okay uh, so this is for federal agencies so fisma f for federal so you remember that federal agencies have to implement a security management in their organization so how federal agencies maintain a information security program it is applicable to their contractors also so if you work for a federal agency and you are a contractor in us then you also are covered under this act what do you need to do you need to carry out firstly you need to follow the nist guidelines okay nist standards so nist nist issues uh, guidelines these are open domain 
NIST is National Institute of Standard and Technology. Okay, they give the standards which need to be followed to be FISMA, to be working under FISMA. And what do the organizations need to do? They need to carry out periodic risk assessment. They should need to have policies and procedures. They should plan for networks, you know, uh, facilities and information systems, uh, security, security of training, you know, periodic testing of the policies, procedures. Okay. You should have threat detection. Okay. And you should have business continuity operations. Standard, nothing great. But those are open documents which are available, and organizations have taken these documents and created their own, you know, uh, processes out of those documents. But FISMA is for federal system. Federal system in US means the government systems, okay, which are the government organizations. If they are uh, under, uh, if they are using computer systems, information systems, which everybody does, then you have to maintain these processes to be uh, working under the FISMA Act, okay. Then came the federal cybersecurity laws of 2014. Okay, that was also somehow named FISMA, but it was Systems Modernization Act. Okay, so uh, it it passed. Uh, you know, uh, it was passed by the Congress, and it had three three major things. So that first was uh, that NIST will be responsible for giving the standards, and NIST issued three standards: NIST 853 for security and privacy controls, 800-171 for protecting unclassified information on non-federal systems, okay? And this cybersecurity framework. So it, this federal cybersecurity laws covered the federal system. This was passed by Barack Obama. I have not seen being this being discussed anywhere, okay? Generally, FISMA is discussed, okay? So there were three laws. Uh, first law was, uh, you know, defense related and inter intelligence related systems will be dealt by their respective departments and federal cyber security responsibility is the responsibility of homeland security second was NIST being responsible for all standard implementation so this standard and third was that national cyber security protection uh, you know act uh, which department of homeland was responsible for any national cyber security aspect and they were supposed to or uh, uh, create an integration center. So any cyber security related collaboration required, Department of Homeland Security was supposed to establish a national cyber security and communication integration center, which would act as a interface for all federal and civil agencies to share cyber security related issues. Okay. So this is as far as laws are concerned. I'll come to regulation separately. So these are the laws. And out of this, you should be aware of FISMA. Okay, and federal sentencing guidelines to some portions of NIPA and CFA. So these are the four things. Praveen, I hope now I've uh, given you a clearer picture because yeah, you were right, sir. worried from day one. So I have, I have segregated <laughs> no. it. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, but this FISMA is again sp very specifically to US. Like, still they ask yes. these sort of things like homeland yes. security. It's specific. No, 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 no. Organization no. What, 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 what might get asked is what might get asked is, you know, uh, uh, a law was passed in two thousand two for federal federal agencies to be. Uh, uh, so, usme first might be FISMA, second might be. You know, CFA or, or it will be not be confusing. But generally, generally, these things are not asked. Got it. Okay. Thank you. What Thanks. is what is what is applicable universally is asked. Okay. But they do figure out. So that's why I'm saying. Right. Thank you. So what happens is uh, NIST will figure out. Please understand. It will say federal systems are supposed to uh, you know uh, follow FISMA and uh, organization lays out all the standards, which is the organization. Now, if you are not able to list out NIST, then probably something is wrong. <laughs> okay, because NIST is everybody knows this. Anybody who's working in cybersecurity, information security knows NIST. Okay. Then comes the concept of intellectual property. Okay. Now, what is intellectual property? Anything which I have done and I hold rights to. Uh, information, piece of information which I have created, whether I have done a painting, whether I have done a drawing, whether I have written a piece of article, it forms under intellectual property. Now, uh, whenever I go through these presentations, I always tell you that I have made this presentation from Cybex. Why do I tell that? 
okay and i will I, uh, generally i have mentioned in all my slides that i follow cybex and this material is sourced from cybex okay now if you read cybex it's got a copyright infringement written behind and it says if you want to yeah, give me credit it just said that that publication can be made uh, reference can be made to this book for any uh, public uh, screening of the information so if i give credits at the start of and any time that this material is this information is sourced from uh, cybex that means i am not infringing on the intellectual property rights of uh, cybex okay remember that so intellectual property deals with any information which links a particular organization or human being to a particular information asset okay and these are the these are the things which are uh, related to generally uh, the thing just a second okay so now we will cover each issue one by one so first is copyright a copyright is generally a right given to uh, you know original works of authorship so you write something you create create a music you create art of, art of drama you choreographic motion picture you know, anything which is generally lit uh, 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 artistic in nature okay and these are the eight broad categories if you produce something like this then you can protect your original work by copyright okay remember this but suppose you copy picasso's painting and make it yours can you copyright it you cannot because that's an original your idea is not you are just copy copying it and since picasso's painting or you know is out of copyright natural copyright you can you are copying it so it is not your original idea so these have to be original thought to be covered under copyright okay so what is copyright protection so why is picasso's pointing you can copy because picasso was 2 300 years back man i don't know when was picasso so 70 years after death so if i make a painting today and after 70 years of my death so if i die at some point point in time and after 70 years of my death somebody reproduces my work okay then he is not infringing on the he or she is not infringing on the copyright but if there is an anonymous work it is protected for 95 years okay you should know these points but which act protects copyright is definitely should know it is this is something you could know you know 70 and 95 you could know but if you are not able to say that digital millennium copyright act protects copyright okay then this is something which you probably will falter okay so you should know that dmca covers copyright this is the only information which is of use in this entire slide rest all is bullshit rest all is not required for you rest all is information which is there for you to know yeah, enacted in 98 gives you usd 1 million 10 years so also what is important is it limits liability of internet service provider so what happens is suppose there is a murderer he commits a murder and comes and hides in my house and i give him shelter knowingly or unknowingly suppose he comes and hides in my house and i don't come to know when cops tomorrow realize that this mur this murderer is staying in my house they will charge me also for hiding that murder okay they will not try to know whether i uh, the owners will not be on cops to judge whether i did it intentionally or unintentionally the onus will be on me to prove myself innocent okay uh, but suppose they are able to establish a fact that i have not given it then they may not charge me but there will be certainly a uh, uh, you know amount of suspicion on me that i have given uh, shelter to this particular uh, criminal okay there might be unless proven guilty unless proven innocent of course but in suppose suppose in uh, you know in the internet world today you send me a threat message on the internet okay that means the internet provider also is at fault because he has provided a medium for someone to blackmail me okay 
so that liability was removed by dmca they said internet service providers or their circuits used by criminals for violating the copyright law they will not be covered okay they will not be liable so i use internet to spread the violation of copyright i i create uh, a painting which is under copyright and you know send its nft to everyone okay so tomorrow law comes and says airtel is also at fault because it provided the internet connection to the criminal no they are not covered because under dmca they will be. but this law as copyright protection law is applicable only in us and not in india please remember that okay but this does get asked dmca does get asked. so digital sir, millennium public one, act sir one quick short thing you know yeah. what kind of question is there in cybex <laughs> like copyright is valid till 70 years after death right but whose death like first author or second author or the last surviving author so there was a question original so, yeah no, Orig- no, no, no. so so that means no, you last surviving author actually. So if there yeah. are multiple authors uh, to same ah. work, like if multiple people have uh, filed a copyright together, so it's the last surviving author. After his okay. death, it yeah. is valid for 70 years. Cybex might have a question, but none of the questions from the Cybex back book will come in exam. Oh, okay. That I can assure you. Okay. Oh, okay. Cybex okay. back questions are good for understanding each and every concept. Got okay. it. Got it. Re- remember that. Not a single question will come from Cybex. That I can assure you. But if you are wrong, going wrong conceptually, okay, then there will be a issue. Okay, remember this. Correct. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, at times, copyright protection is used for software as well. So the software gets covered under copyright generally. So if you see any software, okay, these points: for transmission initiated by person other than provider, transmission routing and uh, are automated process. So ISPs need to. Uh, in short, these that uh, they have not initiated the criminal uh, copyright infringement. Okay, the, their automation, the transmission, automate routing and connection is automated. Service provider does not know the content. Okay, means they are not capa- uh, culpable towards any of the crime related, uh, the copyright related activities. Then they are free from the uh, prosecution under dmca that you have to remember so at times question does come like you know which law provides protection to internet service providers uh you know under copyright and so you straight away your mind should click okay that's digital millennium copyright act because it safeguards the internal internet service providers okay softwares might be used under copyright remember that so questions at times do get asked as to you know how how can software be protected the best okay you know it software are protected best under copyright okay then comes the trademark so you have a business you have a logo okay you can protect your logo with a trademark and how do you protect your logo with a trademark you apply for a trademark registration with us patents trademark office once you register and your registration is received then you can use a r sign okay and the r sign means your trademark is registered with the us uh, patent and trademark office okay uh, in india also we have a trademark agency and we are granted tm okay that means it's a trademark okay it it is granted for 10 years and then for successive 10 years you can keep on applying and get the trademark okay so trademark protects your words your slogans and your logos this is the only thing you need to remember okay and maybe you should remember 10 years and 10 years maybe okay rest all is uh must could know but this is must know so if you falter that what protects logos and you write copyright then definitely you fail and patents are to protect intellectual property rights of inventors so people who are in the uh, profession of inventing something so patents protect that it provides protection for 20 years remember this this is important okay so it has to be new idea it has to be useful and it not should not be obvious so i created a a, a pond which stores water it cannot be patented because ponds will store water okay so but if i created a pond which can store water and never gets evaporated because of its design then it can become a patent okay so there are two kinds of patents utility patents and 
design patents okay design patents last for uh, 15 years okay it protects an idea so you have a design and you said this design can be implemented but it may not be implemented on ground but you file for a design patent and it protects for 15 years but it's a it's a uh, not a, a very good way to protect a i mentioned okay a utility patents are more functional and then comes trade secret how do you what is the trade secret trade secret is not specific to a person but it's specific to an organization like cokes you know cokes uh, manufacturing process is a trade secret how kfc may, makes it uh chick fried chickens layering outside layering okay that is a trade secret and uh, how do you protect your trade secrets they generally don't get uh, uh protected by law but you can protect them with you know uh uh by signing a nda uh, with the employers or with so what happens today the chicken is fried even at the retailer so the retailer cannot Uh, you know give access to someone to understand how uh, kfc's chicken is made or kfc's outer layer what are the ingredients used so to sign an nda okay uh, trade secret is a best way to protect software uh, this is debatable this is given in cyber most of the so- uh, software is protected by copyright if you see okay but cyber says trade secret is the best way because microsoft uses it uses it okay and that's why such debatable questions will never get asked okay uh so they say that copyright is used to protect the text of the software okay today you no more use software in a cd you uh, execute the software in a cloud you you use maximum applications as a service okay today you don't download adobe acrobat anywhere anymore you don't download you know uh, office anymore you are working on office 365 which is again a saas based application so you protect the code with copyright that's what cybex says and trade secret is best way of protecting this and they say that microsoft has won a lot of legal battles by using trade secret as a way to protect their software okay <clears throat> from this comes the uh, economic espionage act this is again a important thing it does get asked okay which is the law uh, implemented in us uh, which stops passing of information uh, between two you know foreign nations so you know it's economic espionage act okay so it uh, uh, prevents trade secret stealing between a us company or a government agency and a foreign government or agent it prohibits that okay so two major provisions and stealing trade secrets under other circumstances so if you are stealing the trade secret of coca cola from us and passing it to india or iran or any other country then you face a fine of 5000 15 years imprisonment lot of companies have lot of indian companies lot of other companies have chinese companies have faced this okay? and they have landed up in prison <laughs> and so you had a chinese employee who worked in in uh, their uh, atomic sen- uh, research center and he passed information and that guy got you know imprisonment for 15 years uh, and if you steal trade secrets under any other circumstances it is uh, you know 2 lakh 50000 dollars and 10 years imprisonment not asked but you should know that economic espionage if you are carrying out stealing of information uh, from us companies and passing it out you are liable for action uh there are multiple ways in which softwares are secured by licensing okay so how, how do you license a software uh you know you can have a written agreement so you make a big uh, suppose you make a very major software for uh, a very big uh, company or a very big government organization say railways you make a software entire erp software which is a multi crore project you know multi billion dollar or a million dollar project uh um, and now you want to protect that and so railways will make you contractually agree that you are not going to leak that software anymore so that's a, that's a written license because you made a specific software for a big firm or a big agency and then there are shrink wrap the small a small sticker will be there outside the software the moment you open it okay and it breaks that means you have agreed to uh, using that software in a appropriate manner okay but just by opening that suppose you have click through and agree 
you press that agree button you agree such funny questions do get asked in cissfk at times okay and at times these days you know cloud service providers they just flash you are you know you are legally upset they will just flash it for 2 seconds and it will go off <laughs> so that's how you can protect software in the cloud there are many restrictions uh, for import and export of the us based hardware and software uh, issues okay uh, so there are two sets of uh, laws so remember es economic espionage you know economic espionage act of 1996 protects trade secrets okay in your notes you should write economic espionage act eea 1996 in front you should write trade secret that is more than enough but the moment it comes to import oblig export of sensitive hardware and software then there are okay then there are two things you have to remember if it is hardware and software then it comes under itar remember this okay itar is the regulation under which you cannot export uh, you know sensitive hardware and software and it appears on something called united states munitions itr is a very very uh, tough regulation okay if your company is uh, found to violate itar regulation then it get get out of business very quickly and uh, there are uh, some exceptions where you cannot export your equipment like Uh, they 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 have an organization called BIS Bureau of Industry Industry and Security. So you cannot export your hardware and software to North Korea, Sudan, Syria, and Iran. Okay, that is a restriction which they laid down. And uh, there was something called encryption export controls. Okay, so uh, what happens? U.S. companies make a lot of softwares which have encryption uh, softwares loaded onto them, and uh, because of ITAR, they were not able to export that. uh software okay because it was a, it was on the ban list so now uh, encryption export controls relax that and now you have to submit your software it is reviewed within 30 days and then you can export your uh, encryption software okay with this we have come generally to the end of us laws okay and now we will deal with privacy uh, privacy is one of the most hotly debated topic today and it is vigorously pursued by a lot of organizations all over the world even google's ceo had to you know ask uh, answer questions to uh, us congress okay so how you protect privacy in us it is specific to us and eu it is not specific to any other country so us privacy law is based on something called fourth amendment definitely asked you will get a question on fourth amendment so fourth amendment is an amendment to their constitution which provides rights for basic privacy to a human being in us so what happens is no government agency can search a private property without a warrant so if you would have seen english movies hollywood movies it says there is a warrant so without warrant you cannot search the premises of any guy and that is the basic privacy right of india it is called fourth amendment remember that based on that the first privacy act came in 1974 okay and what is important that you can, it limits disclosure of any information related to a person without prior consent these are the two keywords you cannot disclose if you are if i am a government agency and i hold hold your privacy data i cannot disclose that information without your prior consent these are the two keywords praveen for you okay <clears throat> and then rest all are a formal process formal process for individuals to gain access to record those are all something which you can read and understand but what are the keywords limits disclosure without prior discontent then came sorry sir just yeah. one thing this yeah. us privacy law is different and uh, privacy act 1974 is different sorry mm. fourth amendment is one and then privacy fourth act amendment 19... is your fourth amendment is your right adhikar right. got it it is my right basic right you cannot violate my right no private understand then came a law called privacy act okay where it gave you a power in legal so suppose tomorrow uh, cops come and they enter your house without a warrant now you want to pursue it legally 
so now you can pursue it under privacy act 1974 uh, so no so uh, that is right nobody can violate it okay privacy act is a act. privacy act is a act suppose now org some organization some federal organization say like uh, like we have uidi us has social security number so suppose the organization holds social security number and it has uh, some data regarding that person whether name number email address and it knows about it certain per personal data now i cannot disclose that data to someone else now suppose i have a data in uh, railways and police comes and says hey railways give me your data give me this person's data railway says sorry under privacy act 1974 I cannot disclose that data without the consent of that individual. Got my point? Got it, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So that is a law. This has got no correlation to this. Fourth Amendment is a right of every U.S. citizen to refuse access to his house without a proper warrant by fed by government. Okay. Suppose the FBI comes knocking on your door and says, "I want to search your house. I suspect that you are a criminal, and if you are a U.S. citizen, you say where is the warrant." and that's why go watch a hollywood movie under which warrant is asked that is the warrant okay privacy act 1974 protects your privacy by telling government organizations that without prior consent of a individual if you are holding his privacy data you cannot disclose it okay that is the first act okay now this act was when there was no electronic communication now when electronic communications came then privacy act got amendment and it was called electronic communication privacy act okay and it was a broadened wiretap act before 1986 there was a wiretap act wherein organizations could wiretap into your telephone communications with a warrant okay this got extended to emails okay <clears throat> it got extended to emails okay that is what you have to remember so you cannot electronically invade the privacy of a individual without a proper consent or a warrant from the judiciary that was ecpa 1986 okay <clears throat> then came communication assistant for law enforcement calia 1991 that was again an amendment to ecp so generally these questions don't get asked okay at max you might get a fourth amendment question okay and the moment you see limit disclosure prior consent you know it is prior calia and ecpa generally don't get asked because they are part of the same privacy act So ECPA is amendment of Privacy Act, CALIA is a amendment of ECPA. Okay, and Economic Espionage Act we have already seen. What you should know, could know, must know, always know is HIPAA. Important, definitely look it up. So it says security regulation for your health data. Okay, so what happens? A lot of health data is taken by hospitals, doctors, you know, uh, laboratories. They are. supposed to disclose you how that data will be used okay so if in india it is not followed you go you give your data and you know it goes somewhere you're not bought in us if you go for a lab test if you go to a doctor you sign a consent form because tomorrow a doctor might take your data and might share it with a laboratory so he needs your consent that hey i need your consent if you are tomorrow want to share this data with a laboratory or i want to share this data with another physician or with a central repository so he takes a consent from you okay and uh, hipaa is health insurance portability and accountability act which gives the onus on me if i want to port a health data from my system to somewhere responsibility is mine but i need to take a consent from you so remember whenever health figures out which protects the privacy of health data hipaa is the act and you should be knowing hipaa well okay then then came uh, upgradation of hipaa and it is now called high tech okay it's updated hipaa and it contains two updations one is the uh, it increase the privacy and security requirements of the data which was collected under hipaa and second is whenever the data gets breached you need to notify a person so if your data gets breached you need to notify that person that hey your data got uh, leaked can you just protect it or you know take Uh, some preventable measures, and if data of 500 people or more gets leaked, then you are supposed to inform the Secretary of Health. Not important. You should know HIPAA and HITECH. Okay, HITECH is the amendment to HIPAA. 
which can uh, which is the updated but hipaa is the law okay uh, remember that now how do you protect children's privacy you ch protect children's privacy with copa so if you are a kid who is younger than 13 years you need to you need to give an opportunity for the parents to review so suppose the kid is going to watch something which requires parents consent you will not allow the kid to proceed okay so only the parents will give the consent then only the kid will be able to proceed uh, process that uh, you know uh, action on the website and whenever you're collecting some privacy information from the kid uh, parents have to consent so that is covered under copa copa might get asked what protects the right of children online privacy might get asked okay then uh, there was graham leach blyly act now copa is children high tech is health okay hipaa is health h health high tech health children privacy c copa okay then comes graham leach blyly act glba glba is to uh, you know uh, protect the financial information okay so remember this is to remember this is important it is generally applicable to financial institution financial institution and might get asked as a question that you know uh, you are collecting financial data of your customer and how do you protect which which act is you know applicable for protecting the financial data uh, financial privacy privacy data now when glba got implemented what happened was uh, insurance agencies want to share data with banks banks want to share data with each other that couldn't be shared so glba also reduced that uh, you know um, those parameters so that information could be shared between banks and credit card industries and because if banks are not able to tell credit card industry that this person is reputed or not then how do credit card person know that whether to issue a credit card or not so your credit rating and other things are dependent on this particular act so remember this do get asked us patriot act everybody is very well aware okay this happened after world trade uh, center attacks and it gave blanket authorization with single warrant to monitor all communications of a, a suspected person okay and you just needed a warrant and you can monitor anyone okay that was uh, a problem this act is under question and might get repealed and then came the uh, then is a family education so uh, family education rights uh, are farpa is applicable to educational institutions which are funded by the federal government okay and it grants privacy rights to students okay <clears throat> older than 18 and to parents of minor kids so you might be going to a educational institution and you might have educational uh, record in that institution so you can restrict your privacy information for your education data by uh, educational institutions cannot release your data without consent that is something uh, is a uh, is a law and second is if there is a correction required you can request for that correction okay <clears throat> then there is itad identity theft and assumption does deterrence not of consequence so again if your identity gets uh, you know somebody stolen by someone then it could be protected under this particular itad act okay no need to remember present terms and other things most important is eu privacy law so eu privacy law is something called uh, first was data protection directive it came in 1994 it gave certain privacy rights to all eu citizens but replaced by general data protection regulation so question get asked what is the privacy data formulated uh, introduced in 2016 implemented 2018 okay for protecting the privacy of us citizens us citizens because gdpr gdpr you should know few things what is the data minimization policy and what is the right to forget okay remember that so data minimization policy is basically firstly it is applicable to us citizens remember this applied in 2018 okay and it put the onus on organizations collecting privacy data so you will collect only the data which is required and nothing more than that so if i need only your email id i will only collect email id and i will not collect 
the entire health data from you. Okay, you will have to give the purpose for which you are collecting, how how for how much you are storing. So if you have to protect the KYC data for seven years, you will only keep the data for seven years. After that, you will delete. And who, there is somebody who is going to be accountable for that data. So if you are collecting, you are accountable. If you are processing the data, you are accountable. So remember that. Okay. <clears throat> It also gave, uh, you know, contractual clauses for data sharing. Now, suppose uh, a EU based company out of Germany hires an Indian company for developing a software and they collect some privacy data. So I might be processing the data of EU, citi EU citizens, but I am covered under GDPR. Even if I'm processing the data in India, I'm a third party. It is my due diligence and due care that I adhere to GDPR. Else, they will find me because, say, I'm a very big company and I have a presence in, I'm say, Infosys, and that I have a presence in EU and I don't follow GDPR. They will shut down my business in EU. They will find me with uh, volumes of up to 4% of annual sales. So the fines are pretty heavy. You, this, we will come into fines and other things later on. But GDPR is something which is a must know. Okay, and it is applicable because in your day to day work, when you deal with so I, I deal with clients who are based in EU, and uh, there, 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 there are a lot of uh, we have third party dependencies for KYC processing, and uh, we do follow GDPR very, very religiously for uh, our third party dependencies. So, we, we, we take a we have a proper SLA that we, need, we, we take the information where the information is stored for how long. So we have the GDPR conformance in place with the agency. And the agency is an Israeli company. So Israeli company, which has an API, which collects the KYC, but we, uh, but they are, they, they, since they are in Israel, they have headquartered themselves in Europe and processing the data, storing the data in Europe and as per the regulations of GDPR. Okay. You can also create binding corporate rules. So now once I did my CISSP, I created this. Once I started working for the present company, I created this binding corporate rules as per the GDPR requirements. Okay. Now in Canada, there is so the moment it comes EU, you know GDPR. In Canada, it is called PIPEDA, Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. It protects the privacy information for Canadian citizens. In US, it is US Privacy Act and Fourth Amendment. In uh, mm, EU it is GDPR in Canada it is PIPEDA might get asked okay may know there are then apart in US other than government laws central laws there are a lot of state laws so one of the state laws is California Consumer Privacy Act so since California is a very large state in US and it is now this right to be forgot uh, so there, it is a, it's got its own privacy act okay so their state act also get, get a lot of uh, you know uh, weightage which is not the case in India. So all criminal and judiciary is governed by uh, central laws. In US, a lot of criminal and civil laws are governed by state laws. State laws there are more prevalent than central laws. Okay. Uh, so in Texas, you might get hanged, but in California, you might not. So in, in, in a state, you might smoke weed and might get punished for 20 years. But in another state, you might, might not get punished at all. So like in California, you will not get punished because weed is uh, legal. So that, that is somewhat state laws there are, okay? Because the states are almost like countries. <clears throat> so under California Protection Act, you have the right to be forgotten. You want to get forgotten, you can. So remember this right to be forgotten is there in GDPR also, okay? And then finally, you have to be compliant. So whenever you are assessing security management, you have to understand that you might have to be compliant to some regulations. So for credit card, it, debit card, it is PCI DSS. For financial systems, it is Surveys Oxley Act. We will cover this in greater details later. But remember that the moment fi financial systems come, remember Surveys Oxley Act, remember PCI DSS compliance, credit card, debit card. This is generally known to everyone. So you might be working under compliance and ensure that you work uh, in those compliance uh, framework okay so uh, at times you might do a lot of contracting and procurement 
and once you do such contracting and procurements uh, keep in mind that what are your contractual obligations and how are you dependent on those contractual obligations and your governance should review these issues uh, what kind of encryption do they have uh, how are the storage storaging or processing information sensitive information so if you are dependent on uh, you know suppose you are a very big uh, corporation so few days back uh, so okay i'll give you an example of a uh, us only uh, so us has a, a something called a government cloud which is uh, made by amazon okay so a few days back few years back uh, there was a controversy and you know microsoft got that contract uh, it was a it was a billion dollar contract multi billion dollar contract to create the government infrastructure for cloud okay. and first microsoft got it and then now uh, they went to court and for finally amazon got it and amazon has a government cloud so if you go to aws you will find log into aws government cloud okay now suppose you are a very big company and you want to go to aws cloud okay so you want to understand how your data will be processed so aws might give you a uh, a uh, uh, good uh, you know documentation and it might tell you what controls do they implement encryption do they implement but when i as a small company you know a, a small million dollar company or a you know multi million dollar 50 to 15 million dollar company i go to aws and i want to have my functioning will aws entertain me uh, that will they tell me how your data is protected it only gives me you know what they follow if i agree to their point they just give me a sla and they automatically refund me any money if there is any outage so they give me a 99.9999% availability if that threshold is not crossed they refund the money back they give me credits for not adhering to the availability status but they never i never come to know what kind of encryption control does aws has at the back end so when i say that ec2 instance uh, you know is uh, encrypted they show us encryption they show us the key but i don't know what encryption control are they algorithm are they using okay what kind of audits aws goes through i don't know okay but i do know that they follow certain standards and i believe in those standards and i go through their review documents and i review it but for bigger companies when when they offer much bigger revenue they do such governance and they do give us give their companies as to how they are following so like right now i'm aware that most of the government uh, cloud agencies are approaching so india also plans to launch india wide cloud and most of the uh, these cloud vendors are now going and they are aware so they will they will provide a, a lot of governance related documentation they will tell they will prove to the government as to what controls do they implement in processing and storing their data so these are the things which you need to keep in mind uh as part of domain 1 security and risk management and i think i have been able to cover uh the entire domain 1 comprehensively for all you okay so now let's summarize to end so what we did was uh we firstly understood uh what are the business objectives of an organization then we understood frameworks okay and how we implement this frameworks in our security management okay and for this we uh, understood what are the security concepts and then we uh, finally came to something called risk management the objective of risk management was to identify assets okay and to find out risk and based on that implement controls okay and once you implemented controls and then you carried out the Uh, cost benefit analysis to understand how you have mitigated the risk how you have risk how you have treated the risk so this was as far as securing the organization but then you came to continue you wanted the business to continue and then you did bcp and bia and all this works under the framework of laws and regulation and then we did all the laws and relevant laws and regulations and 
from this an uh, important thing that came out was privacy and we dealt with privacy using privacy act gdpr okay where gdpr is very important and then we understood how all this fits into the governance and regulation frameworks so this gentleman is part of actually security, security governance and how it fits into the framework okay with this we come we have come to the end of security and risk management there might be certain other topics which might get covered do let me know if uh, any doubts are there okay yeah praveen so just one quick thing the document the shared no, no, drive link can. that you gave the shared yeah. drive link that you gave it has like you know like very good documents everything is there uh, but yeah. if we have to cover domain wise questions like for practice now we have done domain one and two uh, yeah. I have done done gone through this book Cybex and then the questions at the back. Now, if you have to done domain wise practice, which one you recommend like to quickly? I go told through? you, I told you. Did you did you go to uh, Ville uh, Ville website? Did you go to Ville's website? But sir, that was for uh, uh, that was for practice exams that that to be done at the end. I wrote down it, uh, but I thought yeah, it is for okay. okay. you do, do then. So there are there is uh, so if you want to do domain wise practice. Uh, uh if you want to do domain wise practice then i will tell you okay so there is an app, uh, app on uh, this thing mm. i'll share the link this app app on uh, both app, uh, uh, apple and android you can use that uh, generally we used to generally i used to what i used to do was uh, I used to uh, go on the Ville and do the domain wise questions. Okay. Okay. And I thought it is only for four practice exams, which we have to do at the end. No, no, okay, no, 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 no. Oh, it has, it has domain wise. So it gives you domain wise, uh, all the uh, back questions. Huh? It gives you domain wise also. Okay. Uh, so Vileka, like you shared the soft copy as well, which is there in front of me right now. So, okay. Uh, I think I didn't share. It was already available. <laughs> oh, okay 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 <laughs> got it okay and what's the app name you're saying I'll, I'll let you know i'll let you know that okay. i, I use that is it learn app learn app no it was not learn app it was uh... because app store has something called learn apps here in history learns app isc square's official app yeah it is called is square official app that that might be one but i will tell you i'll give you a send you a link okay but there are a lot of a uh, lot of i i'll give you one uh, i'll give you one open source document which has questions on uh, like, uh, yeah. <clears throat> i mean like you know uh, in this one week next once we meet next week so we can go through like few practice questions for domain one and yeah, two. build up our understanding if we get queries we can you know that's the best way to raise yeah. questions i mean yeah. like you know yeah. ask things yeah yes okay true you should you should do as many questions of domain one uh, right now that will clear out all your uh, concepts okay. right exactly so if we have any doubts we can ask next week so that's why yeah. i was asking what's the best yeah, way to definitely. Like, just... yeah. definitely definitely okay Okay, any other question, anyone? Okay, fine, then uh, let's, let's uh, close it and uh, wish you all a very happy Christmas. And uh, meet you tomorrow then at 7.30, same time. We cover domain two. Domain two is not very big. We'll cover it in no time. Thank you, sir. Okay. It is, it is more, or less, uh, more or less repetition of uh, domain one. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Sure, sir. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Merry Thank you, sir. Hello. Thank you. 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 Thank you.